Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with all of this at Topley.net, Webster G. Topley Twitter feed. Let's look at Paul Ryan, uh, fascist economist, because he is. Uh, what is his ideological matrix? Uh, what is the uh, structure, the institutional historical structure that underlies this Republican ticket of Romney and Ryan? Well, Romney, of course, we know, a bishop of the Mormon Church, right, a Freemasonic religious formation. You look at uh, Paul Ryan, uh, the betting here is that he's also a Freemason. But the one thing we know for sure is this is a Republican politician from the state of Wisconsin. And in modern times, to be a Republican politician from the state of Wisconsin, you have got to reflect the views of the infamous and much mocked John Birch Society, the Birchers, the John Birch Society. They were mocked, of course. They deserve to be mocked. They are an obscenity. They are a, a parody of themselves. Uh, that would be uh, Bob Dylan's song about the paranoid John Birch Society, uh, the Chad Mitchell trio, uh, Dr. Strangelove, right? The guy who's obsessed with his precious bodily fluids is supposed to be a uh, General Jack Ripper. Of course, he's, he's a uh, figure for the, for the Birchers. The John Birch Society were the people who were so extreme that they said General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, is a conscious agent of the world communist conspiracy, right? Lunacy. But what was considered an obscene joke in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s is now knocking on the door of power in the person of Paul Ryan. Now, what does that have to do with Mormondom? Simply this, that the John Birch Society over the years has become more and more a kind of satellite of the Mormons. Uh, this is uh, a kind of a political front sponsored by various groups of Mormons. Examples, Ezra Taft Benson was the Mormon representative in uh, Eisenhower's cabinet. He served eight years as Secretary of Agriculture, trying to undo the various uh, New Deal reforms. Ezra Taft Benson then became the top honcho, the first president of the Mormon Church. He encouraged people to support the John Birch Society. Ezra Taft Benson, top Mormon, loves the John Birch Society. You know, it got to the point where it became embarrassing. They had to take a step back in 1963. One of the embarrassing points was the John Birch Society was out there saying, Eisenhower is a commie. And Ezra Taft Benson, who owed his cabinet post to Eisenhower, Eisenhower made the mistake of making him great. Uh, so he's, he's basically supporting a group that slanders the president, his own boss, uh, kind of duplicity that we'll get to, uh, we'll, we'll find uh, frequently in these uh, analyses. So uh, that's one side of it. Uh, in the middle of the Audis, right around 05, 06, you had a Mormon president of the John Birch Society, and you find things on the Internet about how that guy purged non-Mormons and packed the, uh, the structure, the, the uh, bureaucracy of the John Birch Society with Mormons. Their headquarters, by the way, is in Appleton, Wisconsin, reactionary capital of uh, at least part of the world. But here's the big thing. Cleon Skousen. Cleon Skousen. Mormon, big Mormon, and at the same time, the top ideologue of the John Birch Society. Even though he claimed that he was not a member, at least most of the time, Cleon Skousen is the personal union of Mormondom. In many ways, he's the most famous Mormon writer, or he's one of the most famous Mormon writers, at least of those years, now departed. Cleon Skousen is the top ideologue of the John Birch Society. And this is, these are books like The Naked Capitalist. This is the guy who coined the term, which I've always disliked intensely, the New World Order. It's not new. It's not world. It's Anglo-American imperialism. Uh, and, of course, it's not an order. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's chaos, but that's not order. Uh, his nephew, Joel Skousen, writes about um, survivalism. And I noticed there's a... Uh, there's a radio broadcast of Stan Monteith with Joel Skousen, which they devote to your humble servant. And naturally, I'm flattered by 
so much slanderous attention. And of course, the the accusation is that I'm a socialist. <laughs> you can see the the role, John Birch Society, right? Standard John Birch Society. You don't like something? They're a commie. There's a commie under the bed. I'm, you know, they're all commies, but thee and me, and I'm not so sure of thee. Uh, John Birch Society. So Skousen says I'm a I'm a socialist or a closet socialist. This is all ridiculous. I represent the American system of political economy. I am an American system traditionalist. I don't I don't go for foreign doctrines like Austrianism. I don't go for foreign doctrines or anti-American doctrines like Mormonism, which is a separate nation. So Cleon Skousen, Joel Skousen, uh, Mormondom. There you see why Romney finds it congenial. Somehow the, the stuff is, oh, the, the, uh, all the news pundits say Romney, Romney finds the, the chemistry with Ryan so congenial. He likes, he likes so much to, to uh, go out on the stump with, uh, with Paul Ryan. Well, there it is, because they have this uh, ideological basis. It's very interesting the way these choices get made. It seems to be a pragmatic political calculation made, indeed, in the heat of the moment, but it actually reflects institutional alliances that go back decades. I mean, you could see that uh, one of the clearest examples in recent U.S. history, and it's written up, by the way, in George H.W. Bush, the unauthorized biography, 1992. We had the anniversary, 20th anniversary of that last month. Um, in the case of the George Bush, the elder cabinet, in order to get into that cabinet, the best credential was to have a multi decade, multi-generational alliance between your family and the Bush family. That's how you got, you know, to be ambassador or White House official or indeed some of the cabinet posts. Makes for a very narrow, narrow, nepotistic kind of approach. But you can see this now with, uh, with Ryan and, and with, uh, with Romney. Okay, so this is the John Birch Society, which itself is a front, a satellite of Latter-day Saints, Mormon Church. Now let's look at some of the of the policy stuff. Uh, we said Romney would Romney Ryan would destroy Medicare, destroy Social Security. That's genocide right there. That's a one way ticket to Nuremberg. Uh, Romney to muddy the waters says uh, Obama wants to cut Medicare by seven hundred and sixteen billion dollars. Now that figure is pulled out of the air. Uh, that uh, that me- means. Uh, that is drawn, it's a kind of an inference drawn from a, uh, a government report. The reality is Obama cuts $500 billion from Medicare, and he cuts it from the providers. In other words, he, he says, I'll leave your individual benefits alone, but I will carve it out of the hide of hospitals and doctors. Now, that's very bad, but remember, under the U.S. system, money has to be authorized, and then it has to be appropriated, right? Everything goes through twice. Many people still don't get it. Uh, Under the uh, actual budget process, generally there's a doc fix, meaning that the $500 billion is what Obama wants to cut. But when it comes to the actual Congress, they may, as they did this year, institute a doc fix, which would would roll that back. Bad enough. So, uh, back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So, uh, Paul Ryan, Matrix, John Birch, Society, Top Ideologue, Cleon Skousen, Mormon. Uh, you get the idea. This is this is why it's it's congenial. Um, Ryan says Romney and Ryan both say they're going to flay you alive, but only if you're under fifty-five. Everybody who's already retired, everybody who's already over sixty-five and gets Medicare, and people between 55 and 65 will uh, not be flayed alive uh, in the same way. Uh, and you're supposed to believe that. In other words, they, these TV commentators say, oh, but of course, they, they're they not going to hurt anybody under uh, over 55. They're only going to go after those under 55. Who believes this garbage? It's a slippery slope. When you have a general fascist offensive to carve and destroy the social safety net, to roll back the New Deal New frontier and great society reforms. These little uh, these little quiddities are not going to make any difference. Uh, remember, eighty percent, four fifths, eight zero percent of the U.S. population says, "Hands off Medicare, hands off Social Security." 
slightly less, but still huge majorities, hands off Medicaid, hands off unemployment benefits, and other vital uh, reforms. So we have New Deal America. Don't ever forget it. This is New Deal America, and we've got a, a raving fascist anti New Deal party, the Republicans, and then we've got a, um, what can we say, a, a deception operation, right? A, a stab in the back to the new, <coughs> new Deal, which is the, <coughs> the Democratic Party under Obama. Um, let's take a, another couple of looks at Ryan. Under Ryan, there's no money for infrastructure, huh? No money. You can forget infrastructure. You're not going to rebuild anything because the rich parasites that back Ryan don't want to pay. Romney's background is also Empower America, right, created by these um, right-wing characters, you know, the Vigories, the uh, Ehrlichs, uh, people like this, Wyrick, sorry, um, the older uh, reactionary uh, group. So he worked up, and Empower America then merged, uh, it thinks, I think today it's part of um, Americans for Prosperity. In other words, it's part of the Koch brothers machine. So, you can you won't go wrong if you consider Ryan to be an employee of Koch. Uh, Ryan, of course, coming from the Walker-dominated Republican Party of uh, Wisconsin. This is one of the most reactionary Republican state parties, and the House Republicans are the most extreme reactionary right-wing fanatic lunatic group in U.S. politics. Okay, now in 1994. When Gingrich, uh, with this lunatic group, took power as Speaker of the House, you know, we had Newsweek with Gingrich as Scrooge. He was proposing orphanages. In other words, the world of Dickensian cruelty, the world of social Darwinism. It is indeed social Darwinism. But now we've got to discuss, we've got to have a civil discussion if Ryan wants to kill hundreds of thousands or millions of Americans with his Shaktian austerity and genocide, well, then we're supposed to have a polite discussion about that. This is moral insanity and moral bankruptcy writ large. Now, we also have the attempt to sell Ryan uh, to the uh, millennials, right, to dupe the millennials again. The millennials duped once by Barky Obama, now uh, bitter and disillusioned. The attempt is to, is to dupe them again. Huffington Post the screwed generation may be turning to Paul Ryan. Well, hey, uh, millennials, you are crushed by $1 trillion of student loan debt. Ryan offers you nothing. Ryan voted to double the interest rate on your student loan debt, right, to get it up to 6.8 instead of 3.4. Democrats say 3.4. Republicans say 6.8. I say zero. Make the Federal Reserve pay. Zombie banks get 0% credit. U.S. students who want to have a future have got to have 0% credit. This is the least, the absolute least you can do. So uh, the goal, you can see what the goal is here behind this. The, the young college dupes who went for Ron Paul, right, the leprechaun, they, they are supposed to now switch to... Um, to, to uh, Ryan, right? I don't know whether that will work, but that's the, that's the attempt. Uh, let's see. Um, Biden is a hypocrite. Biden says that the uh, Obama-Biden will not change Social Security. <laughs> the Washington Post editorial of yesterday freaks out, saying, you're not supposed to say that because we want genocidal cuts right now. Uh, we even have uh, Robert Samuelson. The uh, nepotist, right? He's there because his father was a famous economist. I can't see any other reason. He's a no-talent. So this Robert Samuelson says, oh, Romney, uh, Romney and Ryan want to exempt everybody over 55 from their genocidal cuts. That's the problem. That's not good enough. We need genocide across the board. We want genocidal cuts for people who are over 55, over 65. We don't care. And... The Garden State Göring, Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, you remember him. Well, his uh, reincarnation, I suppose, of course, is the thuggish Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, right? An anti-labor uh, goon, 
uh, hates voters, insults voters, right? He has a, a real track record of uh, exploding with rage when people ask, you know, you're cutting my kid's school, you send your kids to expensive private school. It's a little bit like Romney, except if, uh, Christie responds as a, as a gangster, and uh, Romney responds as a Mormon, right? Romney goes into a secrecy crouch, whereas Christie starts making threats uh, to these people. All right. Um, let's, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to go on now. Um, we should mention uh, some things about foreign policy. Maybe we'll get to this a little bit uh, later in the show. Oh, let's just, uh, let's just uh, remember Romney's tax return. Uh, he won't show his tax return. This is one of the themes we want to develop. Obsessive secrecy is a feature of the Mormon hierarchy. The people who run the Mormon church have always been obsessively secret. And today, right, there are all kinds of documents that historians would like to have to look at the story of uh, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, people like this. You're not going to get them. Romney's tax return. Now, he says... Uh, Harry Reid, Harry Reid is, is an interesting uh, development, right? Harry Reid representing the nexus of Mormondom with organized crime, right? The Nevada gambling casinos, right? Remember, Las Vegas was founded by Brigham Young, the prophet from 1847 to 1877, right? The St. Paul of, uh, of Mormonism, we might say. Uh, he founded Las Vegas, but it took a little while to build it up into what it is today. Harry Reid uh, is the one who is assumed to represent the interface between the Mormons and the uh, casino interests. And the Mormons, uh, in some ways, are the casino interest in many ways, because this was their uh, bailiwick. Look at the map, part of the Inland Empire. R uh, Harry Reid says Romney didn't pay any taxes. Well... Let's look at the, uh, the terminology here. When you say taxes, what does it mean? Romney, Romney now says, I always paid at least 13% taxes. Yeah, taxes. There are federal taxes. There's the federal income tax. That's one thing. There's also sales tax in many states. There, I think there are still excise taxes on certain imported uh, commodities. There may still be. Certainly, there's a state income tax. Most states you live in, if you live in Massachusetts or Michigan, certainly there's a state income tax. There's also a property tax. Uh, try as he will, uh, Romney may have wage income. In that case, he's going to pay a payroll tax, right? He may have self-employment income, payroll tax. So when Romney says 13%, does that mean federal income tax? Or does that mean a combination of sales tax, state tax, property tax, payroll tax, and other taxes? Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now let's, uh, let's get into some of the historical background. The idea here is that Romney is a devoted Mormon. He is a devoted militant of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What does this mean? What does this represent? Is it a church like any other? Is it like the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Roman Catholics, whatever it is? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, it is uh, much more close-knit. It is much more uh, aggressive. Uh, it acts as a block far more than any of those, which are politically, uh, especially the Roman Catholics, differentiated six ways to Sunday. It is not Christian. I'm sorry, somebody wrote me saying, oh, but it's, uh, the Book of Mormon is another gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that, that was pasted on there in 1981. So I don't see that as being authoritative. It's not Christian, it's not Judaism, it's not Islam, and it's not American, because, as we will see, for decades and decades and decades, they referred to Americans as the enemy. The damned Americans, we find, in... Uh, in Salt Lake City, all over the place, the Gentiles, the Americans and the Gentiles are the enemy. And the Indian tribes in the Great Basin also uh, found this distinction to be meaningful. We find one interesting quote where an Indian chief says, American good, Mormon bad. So the Indians see this as two separate nations, and I think we should take this uh, seriously. The Romneys are royalty. They are a Mormon political dynasty. 
And the reason they're a dynasty is not so much because of the Romney family, but because of the Pratts. Parley P. Pratt. Parley P. Pratt. There's a canyon named after him out in Utah where he set up his first toll booth, ripping uh, people off, ripping off miners as they trekked to the gold rush in uh, California in 1848. Parley P. Pratt the Archer of Paradise. When we pick up one of Romney's books, let's take it his book, Turnaround. Turnaround is his story of how he covered up the scandal around the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics of 2002. There was bribery, and the bribery of uh, foreign officials was... Uh, done by giving tuition rebates or paying tuition to the sons, daughters, and relatives of foreign Olympic officials, especially from Africa, but also from Korea, Finland, all over the world. Uh, Romney was brought in to cover that up because uh, the people who were indicted for it, we don't need to get so much into the names, you can find these in the written report, the uh, people who were indicted for it said, Governor Mike Levitt knew everything we did. Governor Mike Levitt, currently the head of uh, Romney's transition team. Governor Levitt knew everything, and they were never able to prove that. On the other hand, these guys were not convicted. But um, Romney, in his book Turnaround, where he tries to cover up this story, tries to pose as the great savior of the Olympics instead of the cover-up artist who saved Levitt and others even higher up in Mormondom, he says, uh, the mountain pass that leads pioneers down into Salt Lake Valley, which is today inter- Interstate 80, was first explored by my great-great-grandfather, Parley P. Pratt. Parley P. Pratt. And he, bu- he built a road as an act of speculation and then charged tolls to prospectors. Okay. Parley P. Pratt. He is the archer of paradise, second or really third only to Joseph Smith and to um, to Brigham Young, or at least he's up there with them. Uh, he is one of the top Mormons of these first uh, decades. Parley P. Pratt, polygamist, 12 wives total, denied polygamy, and we'll see that uh, he denied that he was a polygamist, uh, when he was, uh, we'll get it. We'll see how Parley P. Pratt had a bad end. But the the side of Romney, if you if you look at you want to do research on Romney and the family, you say, well, if they're Mormon royalty, right? If they've been in the Quorum of the Twelve for seven generations, um, we'll look up the Romneys and we'll find them that way. You won't because you'll find it under the Pratts. And uh, the trick is that uh, the the Romneys and the Pratts intermarried somewhat later. So the Romneys. Seven-generation Mormon royalty, a Mormon political dynasty. Uh, Romney, we, we read last week all these quotes where he says he loves his faith, he'll never renege it, it's the faith of his fathers, uh, the tradition. Uh, his uh, past himself is that he was a Mormon missionary in France, he was a stake president in the Boston suburbs, uh, he has five sons, they all attended Brigham Young University, Mormon University, named after a hardened traitor and monster, uh, and uh, they are uh, all married to Mormon women, and they all got married in the Mormon temple. So this is Mormon all the way. He uh, cannot and will not uh, flee from this. But now the question is, what does it mean? Uh, Romney has a pattern of flip-flopping. In other words, the doctrine changes. He's got a pattern of hypocrisy. He's got a pattern of secrecy. Um, Let's just take a couple of these things like flip-flops. If we take polygamy, right, very important feature of uh, Mormon uh, life and theology, polygamy is denied in the Book of Mormon. It says one wife. Then it was practiced by Joseph Smith, practiced by the Mormon elite, but always denied. Joseph Smith always denied that he was a polygamist. Well, he was a polygamist up to the sum of 60, 70, 80 wives, 84 wives, I think, is the high end estimate. But he always denied it. And this was limited to the Mormon elite. Under Brigham Young, 
Brigham Young sees that if you get people to become polygamists, even the humble ones, even poor farmers, you've got them. Uh, one of the main problems is once you get to Salt Lake City and environs, a lot of people want to leave. So they have a reign of terror to protect you, to prevent you from leaving. They won't let you leave. They'll put you in jail if they think you're trying to leave. But another way to do it is once you've got everybody engaged in polygamy, you can't go anywhere else because there's nowhere else in the Western world and maybe in, from some of them for the world in general where you could go and practice polygamy in the way that they wanted to. So uh, in the case of Joseph Smith, it's that he can't control himself. Joseph Smith says, every time I see a pretty woman, I have to pray for grace. He just got carried away uh, 80, 80 times or so. Um, and then, in the case of Brigham Young, though, it's a much more organizational, calculated view of what he's doing. But just to take polygamy, the flip-flops, the hypocrisy, and the secrecy. First it's denied, then it's practiced, and, well, first it's, it's ruled out, it's condemned, then it's secretly practiced, but publicly denied. Then, starting in 1852, under Brigham Young, it's proclaimed and practiced, uh, you know, flagrantly. Then, in 1890, it's abolished. But other groups, right, the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, the group that leads to Warren Jeffs, down there in southern Utah on the Arizona uh, border, right, Hillsdale, Utah, and, uh, and the, the town on the other side, um, Colorado City, Arizona, it's uh, still practiced. Uh, and then you wonder today, what's the status, right? It turns out that in, even back in, uh, in the 1880s, uh, sometimes rich Mormons would, instead of keeping their wives together in one place, they would have wives <coughs> in different apartments scattered around town. Well, today, with the jet set, you could have wives scattered all over the country, all over the world. Nobody would know. So the cultish aspect, as has been pointed out, is if you have a religion that says what we teach today is the absolute truth, but then you see that this is changing, and indeed that there's a contradiction between what they say and what they do, I think you get an idea. And the secrecy, of course, is already shown as a part of this. So hi hypocrisy, secrecy, and flip-flops, there are many, many examples. Now let's get into some of the actual sources. Romney comes on like a super patriot, right? He's got his... his uh, one book I've mentioned, the Turnaround book, but he's got another book called No Apology. I don't know what does that mean. He's not going to apologize for his own tradition. No, he means that Obama apologizes for the U.S., but Romney is a super patriot, and he's not going to apologize. He had to apologize, really, uh, to the British when he insulted their Olympics, but that's another matter. So no apology, I'm a super patriot. Let's look at, we're going to see in the next hour how much of a super patriot he is. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with everything at Topley.net, Topley.net, Webster G. Topley, Twitter feed. So, oh, um, Romney is a super patriot, right? Ro Romney's not like Obama. Uh, we have this book here, No Apology, Romney's camp latest campaign biography. He's had several. Uh, and he warns that uh, Obama has issued apologies, criticisms of America in speeches in France, England, Turkey, Cairo, CIA headquarters, National Archives, United Nations. He gets praise from Fidel Castro, Chavez, and Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi said, we'd be ha content and happy if Obama can stay president forever. Shows the ability of Obama to dupe People. But, of course, this makes the great patriot Romney uh, completely indignant. And at the end of his book here, he's got the sort of the crescendo, My country tis of thee, we love our country, and on and on. Right? So he's a great patriot. Right? He's, he's, you know, he's going to defend the reputation of American exceptionalism. Well, uh, his family tradition looks different. Romney family values, number one, polygamy. Not patriotism, polygamy. Polygamy trumps patriotism. And we can find this in uh, a number of books. Uh, the Real Mitt Romney from a couple of guys from the, uh, the Boston Globe. And here we find that his uh, great, his, uh, another great-great-grandfather, or let's see, 
great-grandfather, Miles Romney the Younger, uh, the, the original Romney who came over from Britain, from, from uh, northern, northern England, is uh, Miles A. Romney, but then we have Miles P. Romney. Both of these guys work for Brigham Young as home builders and uh, home designers. I guess architect is a little bit much, but that's the idea. They help Brigham Young build his, uh, his, uh, his palace there in St. George, Utah, but they're told at a certain point, go to Arizona. They go there, and they flee to Mexico, to Colonia Juarez, Mexico, in order to practice polygamy. So the idea is, I'm a great American patriot. But wait a minute, you can't practice polygamy. Viva Mexico! So Mexico is better. They, they, they're devoted to Mexico because it will allow them to practice polygamy. And I'm not kidding. Reporters have now gone to Colonia Juarez, and they find that there's still a Mormon colony there, and there are still guys named Romney who are there. Romney has cousins in Mexico who got back there. The reason that, um, that they left Colonia Juarez was not, not because they were overtaken by some great patriotism for the United States, but that the army of Pancho Villa was coming along. Pancho Villa was coming to get them, so they ran away, and we have an, a very interesting outburst by George Romney, right, the father of the current Mitt. George Romney, the guy who became president of American Motors, uh, says in the course of this, let's see if I can find you the exact quote, uh, he uh, essentially says the reason that we had to leave was because of these Mexican revolutionaries and... Uh, Let's see. Uh, blah, blah, blah. They uh, they're down there practicing uh, polygamy. Anyway, the 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 basic idea of this quote is that uh, they uh, and it's very interesting because it's exactly the kind of thing that you've heard out of the mouth of uh, of uh, of Romney that the Mex the Pancho Villa people were envious of our success. <laughs> the politics of envy was practiced by Pancho Villa and the republic and the the uh, the revolutionaries in the Mexican Revolution. Pancho Villa envied our prosperity, and they thought that if they could simply take it away from us, that they could enjoy the same prosperity. But it doesn't work that way, says George Romney. Right, George Romney, born in Mexico, 1907. It's actually interesting. If George Romney had gotten anywhere near the presidency. He would not have been eligible. This is for sure. He was born in Mexico in 1907 in a Mormon polygamous colony for pe people who claim, you know, who were not going to come back to the United States ever. So I think in this case we have to ask ourselves, what is the great um, patriotism of Romney? Now, I want to help people along. There will be a written report coming soon, but if you want to... Um, to do a little work on your own, let's try to facilitate that, certainly. Um, if you want to read up on this stuff, you want to read a biography of Joseph Smith, Fawn Brody, and the title of this is No Man Knows My History. This could, this could apply to Mitt Romney, too. No Man Knows My History, because I don't want him to. Fawn Brody, No Man Knows My History, that's the best biography of Joseph Smith, the best biography of Brigham Young, is called The Lion of the Lord by Stanley P. Hirson, H-I-R-S-H-S-O-N, Hirson. If you want to le learn about a very interesting topic, which we'll be discussing today, The Mormon Rebellion, the Utah War of 1857 to 1858, the first civil war, the first secessionism, the first uh, attempt by a territory to leave the United States. This is done by Brigham Young and the Mormons. Then I would recommend Bigler and Bagley, The Mormon Rebellion. That's good reading. And if you want to look, look at the Mormons during the Civil War, again under the hardened traitor and secessionist Brigham Young, then I would recommend uh, The Saints, 
and the Union, Utah Territory during the Civil War, written by Long, L-O-N-G, E.B. Long, the Mormon Territory. If you want to also, uh, a couple of other uh, books, but those are, those are the main ones. So, um, let's start looking now. Let's, let's see what Fawn Brody can, uh, can tell us here, aren't the, the tradition. Um, Mormon Church originates in Palmyra, New York, in the 1830s, starting about, starting about 1830, right? And we won't, we won't go through the story of the Golden Plates and the Angel Moroni, and we will not go so much today into the theology, although this is interesting. The main interest here is politics, and the basic thesis is, and we'll back it up, the Mormon Church is part of a pattern at the height of the British Empire, in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, we have a series of attempts by British intelligence to destabilize countries and facilitate imperial domination by London using religious and ideological uh, formations. And I think I mentioned this before. My, my old friend, the late Professor Ali Mazaheri, Ali Mazaheri of uh, Paris was an Iranian working in uh, one of the French uh, uh, universities, a uh, school of um, uh, social sciences, École Pratique des Hautes Etudes, I think it is. Uh, he always said there were three miracles of the Victorian age. Karl Marx is one miracle who split the working class against the industrialist in continental Europe to the greater glory of the British Empire. The Bab, who founded the Baha'i religion, which was a means of, of getting, uh, precipitating a group of um, ex-Muslims who could go to work for the British colonial administration, and Joseph Smith and the Mormons. Right? And uh, I would add to this the celestial kingdom of the Taiping in 1840s, 1850s. You have a uh, Christian, again, it's, it's, uh, I use the word advisedly, a Christian rebellion in southwest China, which is very little known, but it's the biggest military event of the 19th century. 20 to 30 million people, million, were killed with armies between 3 and 5 million, perhaps bigger than the Napoleonic Wars, certainly bigger than the American Civil War. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Uh, Professor Mazahari of, uh, of uh, Paris used to say the three miracles of the Victorian age, the height, height of the world power of the British Empire, when the British were contending for absolute world domination, remember, between uh, the Napoleonic Wars and um, the American Civil War, they had attacked China with the Opium Wars, Russia with the Crimean Wars, the French had attacked Mexico, the, uh, the Spanish had taken over Hispaniola once again, violating the Monroe Doctrine. The uh, British were on the march everywhere. You had the Sepoy Mutiny or Great Mutiny in India. This is all an attempt to destroy any center of resistance, to, to tend towards, I guess, something of what we've had now under U.S. auspices in the last couple of decades. Uh, and as part of this, say part of the weakening of China, is the celestial kingdom of the Taiping. And again, I stress... 20 to 30 million dead, with armies of several million on each side, waging total war, burning crops, burning cities, and so forth, all because the leader of this decided that he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ. So, Karl Marx and Marxism, to split the continental Europeans, play the workers against the industrialists, the Bab, to introduce a schism inside of uh, Islam, the Taiping, to destroy Chinese society from the inside, and Joseph Smith and Mormonism. And the idea is that it, when you have apocalyptic, antinomian, messianic movements, they will tend to destroy the society that they're in, uh, more or less. Uh, this is not new, right? Savonarola, unleashed by the Venetians against Florence in the 1490s. Same story. And as I hope to show uh, before too long... Martin Luther, similarly, unleashed by the Venetians. That Venetian 
tradition transmigrated to Britain. It's the Byzantine tradition, and it says religious entities serve state policy. And uh, this is not good. Got to keep them separate. That's the genius of the Western world. But, of course, for the Mormons, that's impossible. The Mormons want a theocracy. You know, Al-Qaeda says that if, if you're not the caliphate, you're not a legitimate government. Well, there are lots of Mormons from Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, who say the only acceptable form of political organization is the kingdom of God, a theocracy, or theodemocracy, as Joseph Smith tried to say when he was running for president. Uh, it's got to be a theocracy, and it can't be representative government. It's got to be ruled by uh, prophets, right? It's got to be ruled under revelations, not under public laws. So, the, the Mormons always show, Joseph Smith always shows, that he has a really good world intelligence picture. He is well informed. Now, uh, for very early example of this, December 25th, 1832. We are in the middle of the nullification crisis with South Carolina, right? The tariff, modest uh, as it was, was considered a tariff of abominations by the uh, hotheads, the fire eaters, the subversives down in South Carolina, down in that cradle of secessionism, and uh, they were threatening to nullify and then to leave the Union. And uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, bad as he was, uh, didn't want to take it that far at the moment, felt he was personally being challenged, so uh, bad fights bad, and, uh, and somehow uh, the U.S. survived the moment. That's how the government is supposed to work, right? Make bad, fight bad to, the, to diminish the total amount of bad. But here we are, Joseph Smith, on Christmas Day, 1832. He says, Verily, thus saith the Lord, concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place. For behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states, and the southern states will call on other nations, even the nation of Great Britain, as it is called, and they shall also call upon other nations, in order to defend themselves, and war shall be poured out upon all nations. And then the usual apocalyptic stuff, right? If you want to know where the apocalyptic style uh, in the right-wing libertarian community comes from, look no further. It shall come to pass, after many days, slaves shall rise up against their masters, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed the inhabitants of this earth shall mourn, and with famine and plague and earthquake and thunder of heaven and fierce and vivid lightning, the inhabitants of the earth shall be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of Almighty God. So here's a prediction from 1832 of a civil war with the British intervening on the side of the uh, Confederacy, basically, what almost happened, and which was unquestionably in the 1830s already the plan of the British um, and uh, U.S. Freemasonic Confederate, you know, Dixiecrat, uh, networks that eventually carried out uh, secession. So you could say, in, even in 1832, he's already tuned in, wired in to British intelligence. But now let's uh, let's be a little bit more specific. Here we are in June of 1835. We have a British clergyman, the Reverend John Hewitt, comes to visit uh, the Mormons. Now, uh, this, by this time, I believe they're in Kirtland, Ohio. Right? They're they're taking part in the Massive speculation, right? The pet banks uh, leading up to the Panic of 1837, terrible event uh, for the United States. So uh, it turns out that Hewitt represents some charismatic Pentecostalists, some people who like to speak in tongues, and uh, they have prophets who come to their services and they prophesy in the middle of the service. This is called the Catholic Apostolic Church. Uh, and this gets us right to the heart of the British establishment once again. So the, the Catholic Apostolic Church, charismatic Pentecostalist mystics in Britain, uh, say, oh, the Mormons are a kindred spirit. Now, undoubtedly, they, they, they knew about the Mormons. I am not arguing that uh, it was British intelligence that put the golden plates in the hands of Joseph Smith. That would be uh, too much. But once Joseph Smith published that book, 
the Book of Mormon, right, 1830, thereabouts. Uh, then uh, London is going to pick up on it, and they're going to see what can be done with this guy, as they did with, uh, with Luther and, and others, right, similar, similar pattern. Uh, so they say, oh, the Holy Spirit is blowing there in, uh, in Britain. Uh, interesting parallels, the Catholic Apostolic Church has 12 apostles, right, the Quorum of the Twelve, uh, in effect, uh, that's not conclusive, but at least it's something. Now, here, here we go. The Catholic Apostolic Church gets you right to the top of the British government and the British Foreign Office. The Catholic Apostolic Church originated in the preaching of Edward Irving. Edward Irving is a Scottish Presbyterian who found this new church, and he, interestingly enough, is a great friend of Thomas Carlyle, the essayist. And Thomas Carlyle, the Victorian essayist, is one of the heirs of Jeremy Bentham running the British Literary Intelligence Establishment. Back in a minute. We'll come back to World Crisis Radio. So we've just had the, uh, the prophecy from Joseph Smith of the Civil War with the British intervening, as was the intention. This is from Christmas 1832. We got Joseph Smith saying the British are going to come and help South Carolina to secede from the Union. There's going to be a terrible war. Um, and then, in uh, 1835, we get the British emissary, Reverend Hewitt, who comes and spends a few days with the Mormons, profiles them, undoubtedly sends a report. Uh, and then uh, the connections go into another form. Uh... The Catholic Apostolic Church, founded by Edward Irving, mystic, charismatic Pentecostalist. And again, if you look, if you pick up Thomas Carlyle, very famous Victorian essayist, man of letters, his, his big book is Reminiscences. The Reminiscences of Thomas Carlyle, well, he's got a part about his own wife, but uh, even before that, he's got Edward Irving. So uh, you're talking top-level British intelligence. Now, Carlyle, of course, the controller of Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, close to Mazzini. Um, we could go on and on. Let's just see here one of our sources. The Catholic Apostolic Church, which is, again, Edward Irving, the charismatic Pentecostalist, who sends this envoy to, um, to meet the Mormons in 1835. The Catholic Apostolic Church originated in the preaching of Edward Irving, a Scottish Presbyterian who had moved to London in 1822 and had quickly attracted a fashionable following, the upper class, the bosses, the elite, the British aristocracy. So large and stylish were his congregations that the coaches of the people coming to hear him lined up for four miles outside his Caledonian chapel in Hatton Garden. His followers included members of parliament, members of parliament, rich lawyers and bankers, clergymen from the Church of England and the Scottish Kirk. Thomas Carlyle, the famous essayist, came to hear him, and George Canning, the British foreign minister, mentioned Irving's name favorably in parliament. So here we have the British foreign secretary, George Canning, endorses this guy Irving and the Catholic Apostolic Church in the British Parliament. It is a branch of the British Foreign Office, and that's who gets in touch with the Mormons in 1835. Get the picture, and again, with Carlyle, he's the, he seems to have a specialty for the U.S., but not only, right? Um, he's... Uh, in touch with um, Ralph Waldo Emerson is basically his his guy, um, and then in 1837, Joseph Smith sends his first group over to uh, to England, and uh, this is now Heber Kimball and Orson Hyde. He's, they're, they're, the two of them are sent to England in 1837, so two years after that. And in 1839, he says, 
the quorum of the Twelve, the whole leadership of the Mormon Church, has to make a pilgrimage to England for recruiting. And one of them is Mitt Romney's great-great-grandfather, Parley P. Pratt. Now, uh, setting up an operation in England is not something you can do unless the British government approves what you're doing. Uh, they, they set up a newspaper called the Millennial Star, right? again, apocalyptic. Uh, they don't get anywhere in London. They don't get anywhere in the south of England, it's clear. But in the north, among the factory people, in the wretched of the earth, people who are poor, uh, again, wretched of the earth, superstitious, miserable, uh, the Mormons can recruit them. And what Brigham Young sets up is a, uh, a, a travel agency, basically, where they say, we'll, uh, and it's, this is nothing new, right? This is the indentured servant uh, pattern. It used to be in the, in the 18th century, you want to go to the New World, you got to, you know, if you can't pay for the passage in the ship, can't pay the fare, you got to become an indentured servant for two or three years after that, or how many years, and uh, that way you pay for your trip. Well, the Mormons do pretty much the same thing. You're going to owe them when you get there. They'll send you to uh, New Orleans and up the Mississippi River and then to Nauvoo or later on to Salt Lake City, wherever it is. So uh, they set up a recruiting base in England, and they ultimately recruit 30,000 saints to come to the New World. Uh, And they also set up a a multi-thousand congregation over there. In other words, there's a whole Mormon establishment inside Britain. Now, again, I submit, you can't create a newspaper in England uh, and you can't carry on these activities unless the government has decided to tolerate you. Otherwise, and we do have some examples of this, right, the local parish priests of the Church of England are going to get after you, right, because you're muscling in on their racket, and then you'll be repressed, right? Then the beetle will come after you. But in this case, it doesn't happen. Yeah, it's not going to happen because Foreign Secretary George Canning, who later became the Prime Minister, I believe, has endorsed them in Parliament and uh, Thomas Carlyle, undoubtedly their other connections. You've also got, during the, the career of the Mormons, you've got a parade of, of British agent types who come over there. One very obvious one, Sir Richard Burton. Sir Richard Burton is the Orientalist who did the Thousand and One Nights, right? Scheherazade the Arabian Nights, he's a profiler, mainly from the Middle East, but, uh, you know, he's seen the harems of the Ottoman Empire, he's going to see the harems of, uh, of Brigham Young in, uh, in Salt Lake City. Another important one is Edwin de Leon. De Leon, this is a uh, guy who later becomes a confederate, but he spends some time there also uh, profiling. So um, the intelligence connections are huge. Now, the White Horse prophecy, right? the thing that, that uh, Mitt Romney may be attempting to, uh, to carry out um, the, essentially with this, uh, this prophecy, we have uh, Joseph Smith uh, making these uh, predictions. Let's see if we can find the, the uh, White Horse prophecy. Uh, oh, one other thing is that at a certain point, Joseph Smith believes that he can actually get Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to convert to become Mormons. <laughs> well, uh, no, that won't work. But uh, he wants to do it, and he has these uh, poet tasters who write uh, stories about it. So, um, the uh, White Horse uh, Prophecy... This is, uh, we have several versions of this. We want to look at one of, the, one of the longer ones. Let's go through this. The White Horse Prophecy, uh, and then they're going to say, oh, no, it's not really an official prophecy uh, at all. Now we are in uh, 1843 with Joseph Smith. So we've had the prediction of the Civil War in 1832. We've had the first people sent over. We've had the British envoy coming to see the Mormons in 1835. In 1837, uh, Joseph Smith sends two top honchos to Britain in 1839. I believe he sends the entire twelve. I think we said uh, they've been over. They stay over there for a year, year and a half, right? Missionaries. Uh, but then 
1843, we have a, uh, another uh, prophecy here. And this is the White Horse prophecy. This is that they're going to have um, political power for the Mormons. And the question is, is this what Romney is determined to carry out? Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Okay, let's see if, if we can um, finish covering this. Now, so the idea is the, the relation of the Mormons to British intelligence, the following. 1832, Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy, with the British intervening on the side of the Confederates, which was the British plan. 1835, the representative of the uh, Irving, Irving's, uh, Edward Irving's Catholic Apostolic Church, endorsed by the Foreign Secretary George Canning, Thomas Carlyle, bigwigs. This guy arrives as an emissary to the Mormons. In 1837, Joseph Smith sends Kimball and Hyde to Britain. In 1839, Joseph Smith orders the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, all of them, to go to Britain and set up the recruiting and publishing operation there. They actually depart in 1840. Now, somewhat later, we're talking uh, 1843 at this point, we got the, uh, May 1843, we've got the White Horse Prophecy. So, the White Horse Prophecy is, again, they'll claim that it's not uh, binding, it's not what they believe, uh, but, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is a shelf doctrine. Uh, again, everybody, many, many churches have exoteric, esoteric. Esoteric, what they tell the public at large. Ex- uh, exoteric, esoteric is what they tell themselves secretly in release, and the, uh, the exoteric is for the public uh, at large. So, uh, the idea of this is then uh, that he's talking to uh, a couple of uh, people, and he says, I will speak in a parable like St. John the Revelator. You will go to the Rocky Mountains, and you will be a great and mighty people established there, which I will call the White Horse of Peace and Safety. So the Mormons are going to be sent there. Now the idea, of course, is if you control the Inner Mountain West and the Great Basin, you can cut off California and Oregon from the eastern part of the United States, because the British plan is not just to have southern secessionism, but then a series of secessions so that you completely balkanize the North American continent, and it never ends. So he tells them, keep petitioning Congress for redress of grievances, but uh, the principal thing is the Constitution will hang by a thread. This is the part that is entered into the Mormon lore. Uh, You will see the Constitution of the United States almost destroyed. It will hang like a thread as fine as a silk fiber. And then he goes into this thing. I love the Constitution. It was made by the inspiration of God. It will be preserved and saved by the efforts of the white horse. This is double think. In other words, I'm going to create a theocracy, but at the same time I'm going to claim that it's the Constitution. This is the degradation of the concept of the Constitution to a kind of buzzword, which we see in so many reactionaries today, right? They talk about the Constitution. It has nothing to do with uh, the Constitution. Just, you know, I don't like it. It must be unconstitutional. The Constitution will be preserved and saved by the efforts of the white horse and by the red horse who will combine in its defense. Now, I told you already last week, the British are the red, right? The red coats. This does not uh, change. Uh, He tells you later on in the same prophecy, uh, the uh, British are always associated with red. One of the particular features of England is the established red coat. It makes them a target, but they still conquer the world. So the white horse and the red horse will team up against the pale horse. The pale horse is the United States of America, the bad guys, the Gentiles, the damned Americans. Um, There'll be lots of wealth in the Rocky Mountains, but there will be a tremendous economic crisis. Uh, The banks of every nation will fall. (laughs) 
sounds like the you know the the deflationary crash desired by the Austrian school. The time will come when the banks of every nation will fall, and the only two places that will be safe where people can deposit their gold and treasure will be the White Horse, the Mormons in the Rocky Mountains, and the Bank of England. Terrible revolution will take place in the United States. Uh, brother against brother, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, murder, bloodshed, and rape. But there will be peace and love in the Rocky Mountains. Hundreds of thousands will flock into the Rocky Mountains. Many will come with bundles under their arms. They want to flee to Zion. And um, the Turkish Empire of the Crescent will be uh, crushed because they have to be forced to allow the preaching of the gospel. Uh, They've also, uh, you're going to have the best people flocking to England and Great Britain. Uh, God has given England and Great Britain power in the nations for a thousand years. This is an endorsement. And it's England and France are going to uh, ally. Right? This, is, this is already going on under Louis-Philippe and the July monarchy, and even more than under Napoleon III. England and France will be bitter enemies, but they will ally together to keep Russia from conquering the world. The Greek patriarch and the Roman pope will have to be united. They'll be merged. Uh, and what a wonderful guy Henry VIII was. See, it's all, all Anglophile, all pro-British. The lion and the unicorn of England, these are great symbols. And then there's something called the black horse. And the black horse is the, the, uh, the, the slaves, the, the black Afro-American slaves. The, um, there's going to be this huge war. The black horse will flee to the invaders and join them because they're afraid of becoming slaves again. So it looks like the white horse of Mormonism, the red horse of, of uh, the British, the black horse of the slave rebellion, which, we, which he's already talked about before, uh, will rise up and this will uh, basically destroy the pale horse. During this time, the white horse will have gathered strength, will send out our elders, and will gather in the honest of heart from the pale, for, pale horse, the people of the United States, and get them to stand by the Constitution. The good people from Germany, Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, Holland, and Belgium, this is where the Mormons primarily recruited, especially England, but also Northern Europe, only Lutheran areas, Protestant areas, not Catholic areas, came to them. Uh, there will be peace and safety in the Rocky Mountains, protected by the guardians, the white horse and the red horse, and the coming of the Messiah will be so natural that um, it practically, uh, it'll just be a smooth continuum. Uh, There's a danger from the Chinese. The heathen Chinese will invade the land beyond the Rocky Mountains. That has to be stopped. Uh, And then Gog and Magog come on the scene, The nations of the earth will be led by the Russian czar, and his power will be great. But all opposition will be overcome, and this land will be the Zion of our God. Amen. So, the white horse of Mormonism and the red horse of the British Empire will defeat the Russian czar, identified with Gog and Magog. This is a British intelligence picture, totally. This is the strategic doctrine of the British Empire in the 19th century. Remember, said it many times, the main strategic conflict of the 19th century in the Eurasian area is the British against the Russians. Always the same, from the Napoleonic Wars up until the coming of uh, King Edward the Seventh. There's a hundred years where they're always on uh, different sides. So this is a British intelligence picture. Notice that Romney says the same thing. Romney says, Russia is the biggest geopolitical foe. Well, he's following the White Horse prophecy. And we find many interesting magazine articles saying that when Romney was at the um, Brigham Young, he was considered to be the great hope of Mormondom. He's the guy who's going to carry out the White Horse prophecy. Now, after the killing of, of Joseph Smith, as we went through last week, In 1844, they insert the oath of vengeance. And remember it goes, 
you and each of you the covenant and promise that you will pray and never cease to pray to Almighty God to avenge the blood of the prophet Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith upon this nation, the United States of America, and that you will teach the same to your children and your children's children until the third and fourth generation. That was in the official liturgy until 1927. It means that Romney's father, George, took the oath. George, Nick, Tag, and their children, all bound by the oath of vengeance, perhaps. We don't want to find out. That's, uh, we'll be delving into this next time. In the meantime, you want to get more, watch Copley.net and Webster G. Copley Twitter feed. And we will see you next week here on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. It's Friday, the 24th of August. And, of course, on Monday, we have the Republican National Convention. They've been going on since 1856. At the beginning, with Fremont in 1856, and with Lincoln in 1860 and 1864, they were pretty much the opposite of what they are today. In those days, this was a party with uh, revolutionary aims. Uh, On a world historical scale, the Republican Party was the architect of the second and indispensable American revolution, known as the Civil War, to wipe out the slave power conspiracy, to break the power of the slavocrats, and also to create one of the greatest land reforms ever seen, the Homestead Act, the Morrill Act. Justin Morrill, a great guy. Um, so we got all that, but uh, of course it's turned into its opposite, hasn't it? Now we're going to get uh, Romney. Uh, it's interesting that in 1856, one of the first things the Republican Party did was to say, we want to put an end to the two relics of barbarism. The twin relics of barbarism, says the Republican platform of 1856, slavery and polygamy. Actually, I think they put polygamy and slavery, meaning Confederates and Mormons. And now the Mormons are going to take over the Republican Party. What, what a shame how things turn into their opposites uh, through all kinds of influences. Now, uh, first of all, let me urge you to look at tarpley.net by about the middle of next week, Wednesday, Thursday, Around the time that uh, that Mitt makes his acceptance speech, uh, we should be offering a written report uh, composed under the pressure of uh, of obvious time constraints, but still um, a report on Bishop Romney's tradition. Bishop Romney. He is a bishop. Now there is a quibble about what it means to be a bishop. A Mormon bishop is apparently in charge of a single church or ward, I think. Um, The Mormon bishop looks more like a parish priest. He's the one who's going to intervene directly on individuals and uh, intervene, well, harass them, uh, guide them, whatever you want. But then Romney also became a stake president. And the stake, meaning a stake in the tent of Zion, the stake president, is a, that's a bishop in normal Western civilization. Uh, the, the stake is the equivalent of a diocese in uh, traditional Christianity. And if you're the head of a diocese, that makes you a, a bishop. So Romney really is a bishop by any count. He's called a bishop. But again, the Mormon bishop is a step below what we have in Western civilization. But then uh, becoming a stake president, that makes him a full-fledged bishop. So we want to look at Bishop Romney's tradition, the one he claims to love, the one he claims has shaped him, the one he claims to be devoted to, doesn't want to talk about, but nevertheless, there it is. So that's number one. Check tarpley.net at the middle of next week, and we hope to have something... Uh, to throw into the world historical scales. The other thing here is, uh, na- naturally, we've we got a, uh, uh, an array of um, 
television reports on the Mormons. I just mentioned three. ABC News this past week had two separate segments, a two-part profile of the Mormon religion in the ABC Evening News. Um, this, of course, these are all cover-ups. Then we had last night, Thursday, the 23rd of August, we had Rock Center with Brian Williams and Harry Smith, Mormon in America. And we also had the BBC with John Sweeney. This was somewhat more aggressive. Well, after NBC, ABC, and BBC, try Topley.net, and you will see uh, that it's quite different. And it's uh, not so superficial. It's not such a meager public relations uh, account because there's a cover-up going on. But the one thing that emerges from this that is not hidden is that we're approaching the Mormon moment. The Mormon moment. A moment of affirmation? A moment of, uh, I don't know, uh, getting back at people? Um, We have to look into this. Uh, Therefore, you have to ask yourself whether you want to be part of a Mormon moment, whether there's any place for you in a Mormon moment. Uh, moment. So we'll be dedicating quite a bit of today's program to this. Now, the other thing is, if you're in Western Europe uh, on uh, Friday, August 31st, Friday, August 31st, I am likely to be speaking in Amsterdam at the Magnet Festival. Magnet, M-A-G-N-E-E-T, the Magnet Festival, the Magnetic Festival. Uh, in Amsterdam, Netherlands, Holland, uh, Friday, 31st of August. Uh, should be with my old friend Daniel DeWitt. Daniel DeWitt uh, will be there with me, I believe, and uh, this likely to be the only European appearance this season. So if you're interested, uh, come on out, and uh, I'll try to have some books. I'll try to have some uh, some other things going on. It looks like it's going to be an interview about Syria and then uh, a, a presentation about the world economic crisis and, uh, and what to do about it. So, two things. Again, middle of next week, if you're in anywhere in the world, take a look at Topley.net. There should be then the, the uh, announcement, indeed the availability, that this report on the Mormons has started to ship Bishop Romney's tradition what it's likely to be called, and then uh, the uh, Magnate Festival, Friday the 31st of August. Do do check up in advance, call in advance. Uh, it's not 100%, but it's becoming more and more likely as the days pass. All right, so here we are, a couple of days before the quadrennial Republican uh, convention. What do we have? Well, first of all, from Obama, uh, probably the most explicit war threat that we've had from Obama in quite a while, certainly the most explicit war threat that we've had from Obama about Syria. This was one of his, uh, was actually the White House appearance where he was taking advantage of the ravings of the reactionary, uh, really barbarian ideologue Todd Akin, the Tea Party fanatic, Tea Party barbarian from the Republican Party. We don't need to go into that guy's raving Remarks, but this 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 is what brought Obama out right, to get the most out of this. But in the course of appearing to talk about uh, the barbarian Aiken, he also uh, got off a war threat, which was that if the Syrian government moves or uses chemical weapons, then the U.S. will attack, invade, go in with troops. Um, obviously. Uh, a sickening reminiscence, a sickening uh, atavism of the mad dog Bush, the younger administration, right? The chemical weapons in Iraq, huh, the WMD of Saddam Hussein. Here it is again. Uh, the red line is supposedly the chemical weapons, and uh, we've got stories now that U.S. special forces all around the Middle East are on high alert to intervene in Syria. Now, again, this, this may not be uh, the cakewalk that these uh, forces have somehow become accustomed to. It might become much more 
complicated than they think. All good reasons not to do it, to back off from this stuff. The other obvious potential here is you've got al-Qaeda terrorists now running around there in large numbers. You've got Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. You've got the various Liwa groups, the brigades, the Islamic brigades, and so forth. Uh, if they get a hold of some chemical weapons and shoot them off, then that becomes a perfect false flag Gulf of Tonkin. So uh, a word to the wise is sufficient on that. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Again, take a look at Topoli.net sometime uh, around the time of uh, Romney's acceptance speech, assuming it's on schedule. And uh, also, if you're in Western Europe, uh, anywhere near Amsterdam, you may want to stop by the Magnet Magnet Festival Friday, the 31st of uh, August, because I'm apparently on the... uh, on the program, now, naturally, the question that arises here that's been pointed out by many wags is whether whether the Republicans, the party of God, <laughs> have lost the mandate of heaven because of Aiken, because of the hurricane, and uh, because of all these other uh, problems that they have. So that we'll leave that to the uh, to the soothsayers, but they may have lost the mandate of heaven. Therefore, uh, serious, though, is, is uh, Obama with his, uh, his red line. Now, um, the, uh, there was a high-level conference of Syria and Russia in the past week, and in the course of this, Syria delivered solemn assurances, uh, guarantees to Russia that there would be no use of chemical weapons. Um, what you can see right now in, uh, in Syria is a radicalization of the civil conflict, it may by now actually be a civil war after all of those death squad fanatics have been shipped in, right? Thousands upon thousands of uh, Al-Qaeda killers and their related uh, hangers-on and fellow travelers, they've been shipped in. So it, it may be reaching the proportions of a civil war. We don't really know what the hold of the death squads is on that area north of Aleppo, between Aleppo and the Turkish border, but if they're able to hold a, an area of ground, uh, no matter what it is, then that might qualify as a civil war. There are other definitions of civil war. Take a look at the French wars of religion in the 1570s, 1580s, and you'll get another view of what a, a civil war looks like. It doesn't have to be as organized as the American uh, civil war was. But in any case, um, here's the thing. Think about the United States 150 years ago. Uh, It took quite a while to radicalize the U.S. Civil War. Uh, At the beginning of the American Civil War, there were people, notoriously McClellan is such a person, right? George B. McClellan. He wanted a negotiated peace. He did not want to use total war methods. He wanted some kind of cabinet warfare that would satisfy everybody's honor and then lead probably to the separation of the Confederacy, and then to a military coup by McClellan in Washington, because that's what his clique talked about the whole time. Unfortunately, he couldn't win uh, enough victories to puff himself up. Um, So uh, it's only after about one and a half years of the American Civil War, starting in April of 1861, and then uh, by September, late September, early October, you get Lincoln making the key decision the Emancipation Proclamation, the ending of slavery in the Confederacy, in the, in the rebellious states, then becomes a war aim. And this, of course, means that it's a revolutionary war to wipe out slavery, uh, to save the Union, to be sure. But to wipe out slavery now is essential, because that's the only way you can save the Union. But that's also then the, the morality of the war. And this then leads to a much more radical approach in 1863, 64, and 65. Now, if you look at Syria, I also noticed this when I was there in November 2011, that at the beginning, there was this reticence, right, that that, uh, Assad had even given out orders in the very beginning not to fire on demonstrations. Uh, The the troops were basically forbidden to use any any weapons. There was also a great fear of using helicopters and airplanes, lest that become the pretext for a, uh, a foreign no fly zone so this these these um, moments of reticence have fallen by the wayside as you go more and more towards total war but this is a it's a lawful progress process regrettable deplorable on the other hand uh, the, the the responsibility goes to the door of the nato 
terrorist controllers who have sent these uh, people in and supported them and paid for them and, and done their diplomatic dirty work. So the period of about one and a half years from March of last year, 2011, till now, compares pretty much to the April 1861 to September uh, 1862, uh, and that's the announcement then of the, uh, of the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, which then be- becomes effective on January 1st, 1863. So this is what's happening with, uh, with Syria. At the same time, the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, is increasing its attacks. Now, uh, uh, the um, naivete of Erdogan and Davutoglu uh, is, is unfortunate. They're, they're blinded by ambition, blinded by vanity. They think that Assad controls the PKK. PKK. I'm sorry. Go and look online. Avigdor Lieberman, the Israeli foreign minister, less than a year ago, Last, uh, last September, came out and said, the Turks have uh, antagonized Israel because uh, in the wake of the Mavi Marmara, the Gaza flotilla, the Turks have, have done this, that, and the other thing. Therefore, said Avigdor Lieberman, we Israelis will support the PKK. Notorious is also Daniel Mitterrand, the boudoir under Tonton Mitterrand, Francois Mitterrand, president of France in the 1980s. In her boudoir, she would receive all kinds of people, Bader, Meinhof, terrorists, God knows what, but in particular, PKK uh, terrorists. The Seymour Hirsch has pointed out that the CIA, yeah, the CIA supports uh, the uh, PKK, provided that they're attacking uh, Iran. The Greeks, NATO, have supported the PKK for obvious anti-Turkish reasons at various times. Um, so you get the idea. There are all kinds of people who have a piece of the uh, PKK. Obviously, the British are the most uh, basic of all, going back uh, 150 years or what, to the time that uh, that uh, David Urquhart was the British ambassador to, uh, to, to Constantinople back in the 1830s and 1840s. So the PKK, um, the, the, the Turkish leaders, Erdogan and Davutoglu, are acting like a, a, a small boy who has brought down a beehive or a hornet's nest or a wasp's nest and is now getting stung and loudly complains that the, the hornets and the wasps shouldn't be doing that to him. Dear Erdogan, dear Davutoglu, this is your own handiwork. The blowback in this was so obvious. You have a country, again, with that important secular versus Islamist split right down the middle. You've got a very significant Alawite uh, population in the tens of millions. You've got a very significant Kurdish population. It makes no sense to engage in this adventurism. On uh, an interesting uh, press TV debate, which you can see on tarpley.net, uh, one of the experts in the debate pointed out that uh, Davutoglu and Erdogan did not expect that there would be so much international support for Syria that Assad would be so tenacious that Assad would have so much support because inside the country that is is the indispensable part of it they thought it would go more or less like some mixture of Tunisia Egypt and and maybe some bombing a la Libya but it's turned out to be quite different time to cut your losses Erdogan cut your losses pull back and we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Check tarpley.net uh, always, and in particular in the coming week, if you want to learn more about the Mormon moment coming down on you. Uh, and if you're in uh, the uh, Western Europe, Northwest Western Europe, the Magnate Festival at Amsterdam, Friday, August 31st, looks like uh, I'll be there. Now, the, the other big thing, a um, couple of other things to mention. Um, the Israelis are going wild again with threats. Um, this is always uh, difficult to evaluate. Um, they've cried wolf a lot, but uh, again, it's all it takes is one time. So take it seriously, given that uh, Netanyahu is, after all, a political desperado with his octet, his war cabinet, 
split down the middle four against four with a possibility of bringing in one more vote to try to break the tie uh, in favor of war. He's got an institutional rebellion on his hands. The Israeli generals don't want it. They regard um, Netanyahu as an unprincipled adventurer. But God help us if we get Romney, his bosom buddy, joined at the hip since 1976. That might tip the uh, the balance so that uh, BB will go into a megalomaniac phase and start uh, lashing out. This we don't want to be there for. Now, um, we've also got this uh, coming uh, week, the non-aligned. This is very, very interesting. Uh, I would regard this now as in the wake of that important Iran Consultative Conference on Syria. The Tehran Consultative Conference on Syria was held uh, two weeks ago now uh, with 30 countries, right? And half the world, that is to say, Russia, China, India, Iran, Indonesia, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Cuba, Belarus, um, and so forth, it gets up to uh, half, uh, more than half of the land area and more than half of the uh, population of the world, those 30 countries, uh, all of them on a, on a very simple platform, national independence, non-interference in internal affairs, and national dignity. In, in contrast to what Brzezinski thinks, you don't get dignity by being the wretched denizen of a rump state, failed state, secessionist, uh, mini-state, micro-state entity. That gets you nowhere. You want to be a citizen of a big, powerful, modern nation-state, powerful, with economic development, able to fight off ExxonMobil, J.P. Morgan Chase, Halliburton, and the rest of them. So we've got to see what this uh, mood here at the non will be. It starts on Sunday in Tehran. Now, the U.S. is already freaking out, because look at all these people that are going. Ban Ki-moon is going to Iran for the non-aligned. Now, that's, you know, this is about, this is now two-thirds of the world in terms of the number of countries, that it used to be the group of, uh, of 77, but now it's, it's about twice that. So this is the non-aligned, the great tradition, going back in particular to the 1975 non-aligned in Colombo, Sri Lanka, Ceylon. But now we've got Ban Ki-moon going to Iran. Morsi of Egypt going to Iran. Uh, and you've also got Brahimi of Algeria, the replacement for Kofi Annan. Brahimi has at least one point going for him. He wants to include Iran in the Syrian talk. So there's a step in the right direction. But let's look a little bit more at the at the, uh, the possibilities here with the non-aligned. It would be good if they came out with a resolution, let's say, condemning Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and uh, maybe the United Arab Emirates and NATO for fomenting this rebellion. Let's see what goes on. So who's going to be there? From Iran, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. North Korea, Kim Jong-nam, President of the Supreme People's Assembly. Afghanistan, President Hamid Karzai. Venezuela, President Hugo Chavez. Sudan, President Omar Bashir. Zimbabwe, President Robert Mugabe. Tunisia, Foreign Minister Rafiq Abdelaslam. Azerbaijan, President Ilham Aliyev. Egypt, President Mohamed Morsi. Libya, Foreign Minister Ashur Khayal. <laughs> well... Uh, no gathering is perfect. South Africa, uh, Foreign Minister Nkoana Mashabane. Lebanon, Michel Suleiman, nobody's perfect. India, Prime Minister Manhoman Singh. Australia, how did they get in? Who invited them? UN Ambassador Gary Quinlan. They're not aligned like, uh, like uh, well, let your imagination run wild. United Nations, uh, Ban Ki-moon and so forth. So, this is quite a gathering. Um, how aggressive they can be. The 1975 one was quite aggressive. They demanded debt relief. They demanded a new world economic order. They demanded economic development for everybody. Uh, and a lot of them were then cooed, right? Indira Gandhi was assassinated with a few years. Within a few years, Mrs. Bandaranaike was, uh, was brought down with a coup, and so forth. 
from Afghanistan, we're getting all kinds of stories about these insider attacks. Uh, General Dempsey's plane was damaged. Last days of Pompeii. Why not get the U.S. forces out uh, while the getting is good? Uh, li- let's liquidate this. Uh, this is not, Obama could help himself. Obama could uh, could make a massive uh, step forward by uh, essentially beginning an orderly withdrawal at the you know with all deliberate speed so that it doesn't uh, generate its own casualties and problems among civilians or among the forces themselves. But put an end to this adventure. After all, started by Mad Dog Bush the Younger, based on the on the nine eleven mythological uh, accounts. Now, uh, in Europe, <laughs> Samaras, you remember, we followed the Greek elections very closely. Samaras had to run against his own austerity plan. Uh, he couldn't go before the Greek voters and say, I support the Troika, I support the IMF austerity memorandum, the, the memorandum of understanding, the conditionalities, Samaras had to say, no, that's no good anymore. We've got to get uh, a, a surcease, right? It's got to be drawn out over time. We want to delay. Well, we've just had this most feckless meeting of the French-German combo. Um, I am sure de Gaulle and Adenauer are horrified uh, by this uh, impotence, right? This fecklessness, the, the stubborn, impenetrable stupidity of Mrs. Merkel, and now the cowardice and weakness of the feckless Hollande, a real a lightweight now we can see, um, they're, they're agreeing that Greece must stay on the austerity timetable. This is killing people for unscientific, uh, baseless reasons. Uh, austerity causes mortality and morbidity. To put it bluntly, austerity kills. The Greeks have had enough of this, and it's not working. The more austerity you have, the bigger the deficit gets. Ron Paul will never understand, but the Greeks have understood. Austerity doesn't work in its own terms. It does not bring the budget into balance. This cannot work. So Hollande and Merkel have uh, had their say. Right now, Samaras has no cover. Now, here is what we need. Syriza is waiting in the wings. Now, there's an effective anti-IMF opposition that also doesn't want to leave Europe. Greece can't cease being a part of Europe. Greece has been the center of Europe for all these thousands of years. Uh, if you go broke, to be, to be bankrupt doesn't mean that you're not a European anymore. That would be, uh, Europe would have been gone long ago if bankruptcy had been the main consideration to be a European. You can be bankrupt and be a European too. And above all... What does bankrupt mean? You're going to be declared bankrupt by a ratings agency or a zombie bank that's that's ten times more bankrupt than you. So, we'll get back to Greece here in just a second on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with everything at toply.net. You'll uh, news on how to learn more about the Mormon moment, Bishop Romney's tradition, and also uh, news about the Magnet Festival in Amsterdam, Holland, Friday, the 31st of August, 2012. Um, what should Greece do? Well, you've got to get rid of Samaras. You've got to get uh, Alexis Tsipras in there, right? This is the, the one model of political activity that has worked in the past couple of years in uh, Europe and the U.S. to get something positive, right? Ron Paul, you can forget it. You're working for a reactionary. You're essentially supporting Romney. Remember, a vote for Ron Paul is a vote for Romney. That's, that's how it worked the whole time. Uh, and on the other hand, the Occupy Wall Street, the, the pathos of this impotence, right, that they got nothing. You can see that the Tea Party is still a concept. They're still, uh, uh, you know, they've got lunatics out there, lunatics though they be. They're still, still fighting according to their lights. But, of course, the anarchists, right, the ad busters, the David Grabers, of the world, all the facilitators and the people who impose that idiotic straitjacket of the consensus method in the General Assembly, this failure, this, this absolute sellout, well, those have failed. So what has worked is Syriza. So learn something, and don't be a chauvinist. Learn it uh, where you find it. Gold is where you find it. So uh, 
in this case, uh, I would say the following. First of all, debt moratorium. Uh, the Greek debt cannot be repaid. It is a physical impossibility. So the obvious thing to do is to put a debt freeze on that. Hoover moratorium of 1931. If Hoover could do it, so can Greece. You simply want to put a debt freeze on there. You want to focus in particular on derivatives debt. All of that should be frozen, should be frozen uh, and, and thrown into the shredder or pushing the delete button. So the other thing you need to do is, on a European scale, ban derivatives. You've got to outlaw collateralized debt obligations, outlaw the credit default swaps that are used to attack Greece. If London insists on becoming the world cockpit of credit default swaps, then you've got to put up some protectionist barriers to shut them down. Uh, the Wall Street sales tax, in this case the uh, Tobin tax, the financial transfer tax, 1%. Not this tiny tokenism, but something that makes a difference. You've got to shut down the speculative machine that is attacking and devouring Europe. And while you're doing all that, you might as well do Glass-Steagall, too. That would help in that context. Glass-Steagall alone, not enough. Glass-Steagall alone, pathetic as an agitational demand. But if you're going to get all this, you might as well also uh, clean up uh, the mess. Now, this morning on National Pentagon Radio, the Diane Reem Show... The domestic, polit no, I'm sorry, the international hour. Uh, David Sanger of the New York Times says Greece may now leave the euro. That the the mood is against the Greeks, right? Get rid of them. Uh, this would be uh, quite a cat cataclysmic uh, event, and certainly a great defeat for Europe. And anybody proposing, anybody making that analysis under these conditions, and anybody demanding it is whether they know it or not, working for international finance capital, working for London, working for Wall Street, working for the global one-tenth of one percent who, uh, who run the show. Um, remember back in the Panic of 1837, a lot of U.S. states went bankrupt. Nobody ever suggested they should leave the Union because they were bankrupt. It's ridiculous. And, of course, uh, the, the, uh, this idea that uh, you're going to leave the euro... Would, uh, it's like dropping out of the convoy in the uh, North Atlantic. And, and also, back in the in Panic of 1837 or other examples, there's no connection in the real world between a country becoming insolvent and declaring a debt moratorium and a crisis of the euro. What, what does one have to do with the other? The reason they're linked is that the hedge fund hyenas and zombie banks in Wall Street and London decide to link them, and they decide to use the Greek crisis as a means of attacking the euro, as well as attacking the bonds of these other countries. So there we are. Now, the, obviously, at a time like this, looking at the Middle East, you wonder, what is with the Anglo-Americans? They are crazy. Uh, they are crazy already with Hillary and, uh, and Obama, but we're getting the word that Hillary is exhausted, Hillary is tired, Maybe her criminal energy is flagging. Suppose you had John Bolton as Secretary of State. <laughs> Suppose you had John Bolton as Secretary of State. Suppose you had Dan Senor of the Coalition Provisional Authority as U.N. Ambassador. You get the idea. Robert Joseph, the head of the National Security Council. Suppose you have uh, Robert Kagan as uh, Secretary of the Treasury. I don't know what. Um, this is this is also a, a going to be a group with greater criminal energy. Now, speaking of criminal energy, when we talk about criminal energy, we got to mention Paul Ryan. <coughs> now, last week I put out the analysis, which I stress that coming from uh, the reactionary Republican Party of Wisconsin and professing the lunatic ideology that he has, Ryan is imbued with the views of the John Birch Society. And I stress that the John Birch Society and the Mormons were virtually indistinguishable, and that the person, or the individual, where you can see this personal union, perhaps the clearest, is Cleon Skousen. Cleon Skousen, the author of The Naked Capitalist, the guy who coined the idiotic term, the New World Order. It's not new. It's imperialism. It's the British Empire morphing into the Anglo-American empire with a few hiccups in, in between world wars, whatever. But uh, Cleon Skousen, the main writer 
the principal ideologue of the John Birch Society and the leading exponent of the uh, official right wing of the Mormons um, wanted to privatize Social Security. Of course, they're all Roosevelt haters, every one of them. They hate the New Deal. They want to strip the American people of their economic rights. All right, so Ryan, coming from Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin, world headquarters of the uh, lunatic John Birch Society, once a joke, now contending for power, showing the de- degeneracy of the United States. Ryan is one of them. Now, just to document this from another point of view, here we have the Washington Post style section. Monday, August 20th, big headline in the style section, The Willing Lightning Rod, Paul Ryan's stance in daring to touch entitlement reform most accounts for his rise to a bigger stage. Now, here's the idea, that the barbaric proposal of economic genocide against the American people is courageous. It shows intellectual seriousness, say these degenerates at the Washington Post, right? There's, Limbaugh says this is a, right, a left-wing newspaper. Guess again, Limbaugh, it's not. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, the picture, look, the, it, I mean, just en passant, the picture is, uh, that accompanies this headline, is we see Ryan in the middle of a gaggle of these reactionary uh, parliamentary cretins of the Republican Party, and to his, to his left, to our right in the picture, we see none other than Todd Aiken of Missouri, right? The barbarian who, who shot his mouth off this week and uh, has now uh, led to a political row in the Republican Party and beyond. The other one we see there is Bill Flores of Texas. Those are the three we can, uh, we can identify in this picture. But Ryan is in the middle. Uh, but here's the, the, the point of this is, is not this. Uh, it's interesting. But the point is the two congressmen that the Washington Post finds, and this is by Michael Leahy, the two congressmen that can tell you most about Ryan are Jason Chaffetz of Utah and Jeff Flake of Arizona. Flake now hoping that he's on his way to become a senator. Now, what's interesting about that is they're both Mormon. There's a Mormon clique in the Congress, and it looks like Paul Ryan is an honorary member of the Mormon caucus in the House. So, QED, this is uh, the basis of that affinity and that chemistry between Ryan and Romney. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. <clears throat> Another reminder, take a look at Tarpley.net uh, around the time of Romney's acceptance speech, if you will, and you'll find uh, a way to uh, to acquire the uh, report that uh, I've been uh, highlighting for you in the last couple of weeks, right? Bishop Romney's tradition and uh, what the Mormon moment might mean to you. Uh, Notice, there is an attempt to make this a taboo, uh, and I would urge you, don't, don't allow it to be made a uh, taboo. This is perfectly uh, legitimate, right? The U.S. goes around complaining that some governments in the world are uh, reflective of, uh, of a single ethnic group, right? This is one of the big uh, U.S. arguments against Syria. I think it's specious in that case, but um, if you get a foreign policy uh, run by neocons and a domestic and economic policy run by Mormons, that's not going to be very good uh, for anybody. So that's a perfectly legitimate uh, political issue. Um, now, um, the, the basic thesis of, of this research is that Romney's behavior is illuminated by the ideological, cultural, religious, theological, ecclesiastical tradition that he comes from. <laughs> and again, He's a bishop, and he's really a bishop. He is a, the lead, he's a stake president of the Boston, New England area of the Mormons. That's the equivalent of a bishop. He's got a diocese. He's the head of it. He's a bishop. He's also a bishop in Mormon terms, which is a little bit less uh, than uh, a bishop in the West here, uh, Western civilization, I mean, and it's more like parish priest. But <clears throat> he's definitely a uh, part of it, right? He's got five sons. 
They all went to Brigham Young University. He went to Brigham Young University. They all married Mormon women and all married in the temple. So what's with Romney? Well, <clears throat> the main thing is secrecy. <clears throat> it's a combination of secrecy and hypocrisy. Uh, an authoritarianism, an attempt to control free speech and public debate. The, the most recent one is now some CBS uh, reporter from a local TV station says the Romney campaign tried to tell her what she could not ask. She couldn't ask about abortion. She couldn't ask about Aiken. Well, this is silly. You can't do this. Uh, Mrs. Romney, right, Ann says that there will be no more releases, right? You're not going to get anything more about our taxes. So secrecy about Bain Capital. When did you leave? 1999 or 2002? Right? You told the FEC. The FEC, you told um, 1999. The SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, you told 2002, 2003. So which is it? Secrecy about Bain. Secrecy about taxes. Secrecy about the tax returns. Secrecy about the overseas tax havens and shelters, right, in six to seven countries. I don't know if I can reel them all off, but you've got the Cayman Islands, you've got Bermuda, you've got Switzerland, you've got Luxembourg, you've got Germany, and there are a couple of others. And all of this is supposed to be secret and remain secret. Well, this is uh, not, not what you usually get here in the U.S. Um, secrecy about the horse. That uh, Ann Romney owns horses worth about a quarter of a million dollars and the, uh, the cost to keep them in a stable is in the tens of thousands of dollars per year, and her dancing horse, Rafalka, was in the Olympics, but Romney, of course, he wasn't going to look at that. He wasn't going to go to it. So it's, it's all this secrecy. What, what is this? Well, then you look at the Mormons, right? The temple is secret. You're not allowed to go into it. The liturgy is secret. Not only is the liturgy secret, and this is one of the things that came out in particular of the BBC report with John Sweeney is that until according to the people quoted by John Sweeney, ex Mormons, apostates as they're called, ex Mormons, uh, until nineteen ninety, you had to swear a blood curdling Freemasonic oath that you would never reveal the secrets of the temple. You would never tell any outsider what had gone on there. I mean, this is like Skull and Bones or the P two Lodge or the Copperheads, right? The Knights of the Golden Circle had similar oaths. Uh, and this is complete with these sweeping hand gestures across your throat and across your abdomen. You're willing to have your throat cut. You're willing to be disemboweled rather than tell the secrets of the temple. Well, what's so secret? The theology is to some extent a secret. I mean, you can get a pretty general idea. Uh, the history is also a secret in the sense that documents are withheld, documents are sanitized, documents are not not shared. So, serious problems. But you can see where it comes from. If you grow up in a rather cohesive, aggressive sect with a bitter catalog of grievances, this is much more powerful than being a member of some kind of a mainline uh, religion, which is relatively complacent, relaxed, and sated uh, in terms of its position in society and its reputation and so forth. The, the rap against the Mormons is that they tend to be monolithic, that they all tend to vote in a block. This is one of the things that scared people. It scared them in Missouri. It scared them in uh, Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, well, actually, it was the bankruptcy, right? The financial uh, machinations and shenanigans that went on in uh, Kirtland, Ohio, that uh, got them uh, kicked out. The kind of stuff that Romney does, there's a direct line of development that goes from Romney at Bain Capital back to, uh, back to the days of Kirtland, Ohio. The other interesting thing from the Washington Post this week is the, there's a profile in the Washington Post of what did Romney do when he was the stake president, especially of uh, the uh, the Belmont, uh, Massachusetts uh, operation of the Mormons. And uh, what's clear from this is that there's a close relation of Bain Capital to the LDS Church. The, the, these, are, these are closely linked, and there are a number of people, not just Romney, but a couple of others. The names will, will uh, you'll see them in the Washington, you see them in, in uh, 
in various ways. Uh, the the, uh, the 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 top executives of Bain are uh, the Mormons are heavily represented. So it's not just Romney. And the uh, Mormon Church at one point in this Washington Post article turns to uh, to the uh, people at uh, at Bain Capital to get advice. Right? So this is it's a it's a relationship that doesn't just come out of nowhere. So monolithic and uh, and block voting. Uh, we have a profile of the Mormons from um, a couple of years ago here. Let's see if we can find this. The uh, the New York Times at the time of the Salt Lake City Olympics. I'm sorry. This is actually the New Yorker magazine. They went through the um, uh, demography of Utah. Here's what it looks like. It's a one party state, but it's it's the Republicans. But it's the Republicans and the and the Mormons in Utah. Mormons constitute 63 percent of Utah's population. All statewide elective offices, from the governor on down, are held by saints. The state legislature is re- overwhelmingly made up of white Mormon Republican males. Three-quarters of the state judiciary is Mormon. The entire United States congressional delegation from Utah is Mormon. This is 2002. It may be slightly different, but it's, I think it's basically accurate. School boards, city councils, municipal agencies, mayor offices... Dominated by Mormons, James E. Shelledy, editor of the Salt Lake Tribune, which is not the property of the Mormons, but, well, uh, the fact is we live in a quasi-theocracy. Eighty, eight zero percent of officeholders are from a single party. Ninety percent are of a single religion. Ninety-nine percent are of a single race, white, and 85 percent of one gender. You get the idea. This is not... This doesn't look like America. This is not, uh, it's not diverse. It's just, it's politically not, uh, not viable. And as we look at this, somebody like Brigham Young, what's going on? It's a quest for political power. Money, of course, but power. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Look at topsy.net. Keep up to date with everything, including a special report on the Mormon moment, uh, Bishop Romney's tradition and what this might mean uh, to you. Um, and, of course, do take a look. Uh, we might get the details up there of the Magnet, Magnet Festival in Amsterdam, Holland, Friday, 31st of August, uh, probably my only European appearance, of, at least of this season. Um, so we're talking about the secrecy, the hypocrisy, uh, the authoritarianism uh, of the Romney campaign, rooted in this uh, Mormon uh, tradition that he that he so obviously comes from. Uh, remember, Romney's great great grandfather was Parley Pratt, and uh, looking at the sources, there's a consensus that Parley Pratt was one of the main people creating this. Uh, Latter-day Saints movement. Uh, Polly Pratt, Orson Pratt. Now, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were the top bosses, but in terms of who recruited more members, personally recruited them. Brigham Young set up a recruiting apparatus, but that was done by other people in the front lines. Frontline recruiters, Polly Pratt, the Archer of Paradise, this is the key guy, recruiting tens of thousands of people to Mormonism, according to uh, to various uh, scholars. So um, this is an absolutely critical guy, and that's why Romney is Mormon royalty. He's not royalty because of anybody named Romney. He's royalty because of somebody named Pratt, Parley Pratt, Orson Pratt. So uh, it's monolithic. It's, it's Freemasonic. I guess that's what we have to look at. You look at Brigham Young carnal, vindictive, violent, obsessed with power, obviously carnal appetites, how many, you know, 60, 70, 80 wives, 50 wives, um, and so forth, uh, and reactionary. So it's not just political power, but it's, it's reactionary political power, right? It's, it's Cleon Stousen, it's Senator Lee, 
who thinks that that uh, child labor laws are unconstitutional, right? This un- unbelievable troglodyte reactionary uh, stuff. Uh, you look at look at the the senators from Utah, right? Hatch, Garn, Bennett, Lee. Uh, this is this is not a good group. Now there are there are exceptions. There was one Frank Moss who wanted to uh, to bring the water uh, system into play, and uh, there are some others. But um, the general rule is that this is not so good. It's not, it can't be as totalitarian as it was, but uh, that is the uh, the attempt. So. Um, it is a faction. It's a political faction. And that's why you've got to be able to exercise free speech and, uh, and talk about this. And by the way, let me also point out, in these television accounts, they say Mormonism is the fastest growing U.S. religion. I don't think this is true. I think the fastest growing is actually Seventh-day Adventism. And what is the advantage of Seventh-day Adventism? It's ironic because both of them are headquartered pretty well, the they're extremely, uh, they have a big center of gravity right here in the Washington uh, suburbs for historical reasons, right? The, the Marriott Hot Shops started here in, in near Washington, D.C., or in Washington, D.C., and of course the Seventh day Adventist in, uh, in Tacoma Park and, and uh, related areas. The Seventh day Adventists grow faster because they didn't have the racist uh, theology built in, right? And you see, the Mormons are trying very hard to catch up now. You're going to have Mia Love, black woman, candidate for Congress in Utah, and she is going to be the alibi, the token. This is token um, integration of the uh, congressional uh, delegation, and that she wants to go into the black caucus and, and bust it up. Well, this is fairly obvious what's being done. All right, so in previous broadcasts, we have covered Joseph Smith and his Civil War prophecy, that during the nullification crisis, when South Carolina said they were going to nullify the federal tariff in 1832 and threaten civil war, Joseph Smith predicted a civil war, and above all, he predicted that the southern states would turn to Great Britain. And this, I think, is the absolutely fundamental thing that none of the other accounts has really put into adequate, uh, bold relief that the Mormons are geopolitically, as well as doctrinally, a tentacle of Great Britain, of British imperialism, of British intelligence. Uh, Joseph Smith and the Civil War prophecy, saying that the Confederacy will turn to the British. This is 30 years before Fort Sumter, or three decades approximately before Fort Sumter. Uh, He's already got the general strategy of the Confederacy, which is to try at any cost, to get the British to uh, intervene. Then we have the White Horse Prophecy, 1843, 1844, where we've got the White Horse is the Mormons, the Red Horse is the British. They will ally against the Pale Horse, the United States, symbol of death. U.S. brings death. How about that? And then there's the Black Horse, and they, they, this is obviously the, uh, the slaves, the African-American uh, chattel victims of this system. So that's the white horse prophecy. When the Constitution hangs by a thread, the Mormons will seize power and save the country and go on to rule the world. Now, when Romney was in school at BYU, he was considered the great hope to actually implement the white horse prophecy. He's got to be asked about this. Then, uh, after 1844, Brigham Young, because of the assassination of Joseph Smith by a mob, introduces the Oath of Vengeance, which is this blood oath of a vendetta against the United States of America to be passed on to the third and fourth generation, meaning, I think, eternally. That was in the liturgy, in the temple um, endowment, as they call it, until 1927. There is also, as the, uh, the, ABC, I'm sorry, the BBC with John Sweeney point out, there is this oath of secrecy, where you do this gesture cutting your throat cutting open your abdomen, that was in the liturgy until 1990. There is the doctrine of blood atonement coming from Brigham Young, which is patently anti-Christian. Under Christianity, the sacrifice of Christ, who was without sin, to save the world, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, all of them. It is infinite. But Brigham Young says, no, there are some crimes that are too big for that. They go beyond Christ's ability to atone, and what he means is if you kill Joseph Smith, 
then that's uh, that's beyond anything else uh, in in world history. So, blood atonement. You've got to have blood atonement. Now, um, let's just we 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 have any ways a number of ways of attacking this. Let's take a minute and look at the Mountain Meadows massacre. We'll put it in the historical context in a minute, but. Let's look at the Romney campaign of now and see its connection to the Mountain Meadow Massacre to validate this idea that the tradition is playing a big role. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with everything at tarpley.net. Take a look there. You'll see uh, a way to get this special report on the Bishop Romney's tradition and Amsterdam, Holland on the Friday the 31st of August, the Magnate festival coming up uh i should be on the program take a look in advance before you uh before you travel um the mountain meadows massacre it's in the fall of 1857 now this is when brigham young is acting in uh cooperation with british geopolitical strategy here's how it works the idea is the U.S. is going to be busted up by secessionism. And the main gambit in secessionism is obviously the Confederate, <clears throat> the Confederate States of America. And this is spawned by Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction Freemasons deployed from London through Cincinnati into the southern states. Right? Secessionism is a minority coup against uh, an inert or even uh, loyal uh, majority in most of these places, but it's a uh, it's a, a a group that knows exactly what it wants because it's been it's been deployed by the by the British. So the idea is the United States is going to be put into a nutcracker with four components. Uh, the Confederates are number one, and here we have the Scottish Rite Freemasons playing the big role. This is the group that uh, that we see with Ron Paul, right? The the Dixie Crats, the the uh, Strom Thurmonds, and the Jesse Helms types. Then of course you have Canada. Canada is where the British send troops uh, in uh, 1861 to 1862, and they have a hard time because the St. Lawrence is frozen and they haven't built any any railroads. Uh, it's not a large British garrison, but it's uh, significant and it would tie down a lot. So the Confederates in the south, the Canadians in the north, further south, uh, Mexico, where you've got a French army, is in Mexico, and that French army could come marching in uh, to help the Confederates against the uh, against the Union. And then the fourth element of this pincer is the Mormons in Utah, and this is the geopolitical purpose of it. Remember, the peak of the power of the British Empire is uh, it's between 1815 and 1870 or so in general. But specifically, it's in the 22-year period, 1848 to 1870. Call it two decades. That's the uh, high point of the British Empire. And that's when they attack everybody in sight. Uh, the, British, uh, the, the French, of course, Napoleon III is installed as a stooge of uh, London. And it's interesting, people don't, uh, don't understand this. I'm listening to a Carol Quigley tape. He doesn't seem to understand that Napoleon III... Uh, is is somebody working for Lord Palmerston? That's how he, he he wrote a book about it, right? Napoleonic ideas. The big mistake of Napoleon, the original one, is to go against the British. If you just work for the British and with them, writes Napoleon the Third, then you're going to be fine. Uh, 1848 revolutions, Metternich overthrown, Germany destabilized, everybody in Central Europe destabilized. Um, all kinds of you know monarchies tumble, but above all Metternich, because that's the the center of the of the arbitrary powers, right? The Holy Alliance. So the British destabilized that. Uh, that means everybody in Europe is weakened. This is very much like the Arab Spring. We we talked about it at the time. So the 1848 revolution. Then we have the French acting as continental dagger with the British, with uh, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia uh, attacking Russia. The Crimean War is part of this. The Great Mutiny, or Sepoy Mutiny in India, is a part of it. The French send an army to Mexico. The French send an army to Indochina. The Spanish come back and take over Santo Domingo, right? Dominican Republic and Haiti today. And the British are attacking China with three opium wars. So this is the 
British massive imperialist offensive, and the plan for the U.S. is what I said, crush the U.S. between the Confederates, the Canadians with British troops, the French army in Mexico, and the Mormons in the Great Basin. Uh, and there's plenty of connections. Go and read what John Stuart Mill writes about the Mormons in On Liberty. He essentially says, oh yeah, the Mormons, they get a bad press, but it's wrong to shut them down, because he says, after all, everybody can leave. Yeah, John Stuart Mill knew very well, because of the sensationalist literature, which was all over the place, that one of the great traditions of the mid-19th century is horror stories, especially from women, about their experiences in the polygamous harems and seraglios of Brigham Young and the Mormons, right? And there's a whole literature about this. So uh, by the late 1850s, John Stuart Mill knew damn well that if you were a woman or a dissenter, you could not get out of Deseret. And then later on, just discovered a, uh, an unpublished essay by Thomas Carlyle about the Mormons, where he says that Brigham Young is his model of leadership. Brigham Young is a model of an authoritarian guy who gets things done. And uh, he says this is exactly what it is. He builds consensus by leading and getting things done. And the, the argument is very much like Mussolini is good because he makes the trains run on time. He doesn't tolerate disorder or dirt or, or confusion or inefficiency. He, he gets things done. And therefore, writes Carlisle, we envy the Mormon government. We British need basically a new Cromwell. I think that's what, what Carlisle sees, is a new, a new Oliver Cromwell in the form of Brigham Young. So there's a British literature at the level of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a study in Scarlet, right? The first of the Sherlock Holmes books is about people trying to get out from under the, uh, the dictatorship of Brigham Young. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, also uh, somewhat negative on the Mormons, but the, the elite writers, the, the writers who really speak for the top levels of British intelligence, Mill, John Stuart Mill, and Thomas Carlyle, these are uh, essentially defending the Mormons. Dickens also, in The Uncommercial Traveler, we have Dickens gets on a boat, he visits a ship before it leaves the harbor, full of Mormons, and he says, oh, how wonderful they are, how orderly they are. The thing that doesn't seem to disturb him is a distraught mother comes along and she says, where's my daughter, where's my daughter, have you kidnapped her? And Dickens writes, the Mormons didn't seem to be too interested in, uh, in helping her. Well, that is something of a problem, isn't it? If you were a parent, I think you'd see it somewhat differently. Normally Dickens is very much interested in family values, but here not. So Dickens, Carlisle, Mill, British intelligence, pro-Mormon, and with good reason. So now, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. In 1857, Brigham Young thinks that a civil war is about to break out in the United States. Uh, and he thinks this, I would say, because uh, you've got bleeding Kansas, right, under the Stephen Douglas Democratic Party policy of squatter sovereignty uh, or territorial uh, sovereignty in the territories, uh, uh, po popular sovereignty. Uh, the uh, situation in Kansas is you've got armed gangs, You've got the Confederate or, or pro-slavery border ruffians from Missouri, and then you've got the abolitionists, John Brown being the most famous, and they're killing each other. They're killing each other at the rate of 50 or, or 100 in a, in a year or two. Um, it's not a war, but it's, it's widespread terrorism. So uh, John Brown in 1857 is known to be recruiting for his attack on... Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Now, Virginia at that time. So here's the idea. John Brown is backed by this group called the Secret Five, which is a group of Boston and New York bankers. Tappan, Forbes, people like this. These are oligarchs. These are people who are working hand in glove with the British. And you can see that the goal of these people is a lot of them are descendants of the, Euro, of the New England secessionists of the 1812 era. And they, they would essentially like to have the U.S. split up, right? For their own reasons, they would like to promote the split up of the U.S. So it looks like Brigham Young thinks that the Kansas and the John Brown Harper's Ferry are going to come together in 1857 to 1858. His problem is that he gets a little bit too far out in front of events, and we'll be back in a minute. 
Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Last reminder, check uh, Topoli.net at the time of Romney's acceptance speech uh, Wednesday, Thursday next week. Uh, should be something about Bishop Romney's tradition if you're interested in uh, further reading. And if you're in Western Europe, Amsterdam in particular, Friday 31st of August, the Magnate Festival uh, should uh, include yours truly. So uh, in uh, 1855, President Franklin Pierce of Young America, right, Mazzini, uh, appointed a governor of Utah Territory who was not a Mormon. And at this point, uh, Brigham Young decided to implement his um, phased plan for secession. uh, And this involved uh, gearing up, right, he tried to foment an Indian rebellion um, the Congress is absolute. The Constitution is absolutely explicit that Congress has the power to govern the territories. But Brigham Young, very interesting. He always says, "I love the Constitution. The Constitution is divinely inspired." But then, when you get down to every provision, he says, the, "I love the Constitution, but the Congress cannot govern Utah Territory. We have to do it under popular sovereignty, and that's it. So don't send any judges or or uh, federal officials." He also, as you'll see very soon, he tries to cut off, he tries to close the borders of Utah so that you can't come in or out without an internal uh, passport. This is also explicitly forbidden. So in the mid-1850s, he's building up, uh, and uh, he starts this reign of terror called the Mormon Reformation, where he has you know, self-criticism sessions, rectification sessions. This is when he brings in the blood atonement, uh, he's got the Danites, the militia, and the Shen Pips. The Shen Pips being the exterminating angels, and they go to work on any dissenters, so he's firming up the uh, the home front. Um, Buchanan, of course, Buchanan is a doe face. He's pro-Confederate, uh, but he, uh, he does pull himself together, or probably with ulterior motives, to start this up. Uh, August 11th. August 11th, 1857, Brigham Young tells a cheering crowd in Salt Lake City, I have fixed my determination not to let any federal troops into this territory, and unless the government assumes a more pacific attitude, I declare immigration by the overland route stopped. Okay, that's, uh, that's secessionism. So um, Buchanan then decides to send a... Uh, a group of uh, well, federal troops. This is a pathetic exercise because the general that he puts in charge of it is Albert Sidney Johnston, who is a is a Confederate, and he's not he's not going to fight secessionism because he's already uh, thinking about secessionism himself. So, in the middle of all this, after Brigham Young had said, "Don't you dare come in or out of Deseret without my special written permission," my safe conduct, or my internal passport, we get the Fancher-Baker party coming from Arkansas. 140 peaceful Arkansas travelers, or thereabouts, the family names Fancher, Baker, Cameron, Jones, Dunlap, Mitchell, Huff, Tackett, Miller, Woods, from northwest Arkansas, not so far from uh, Texas, from east Texas. Um... Brigham Young calls John D. Lee, his honorary son, tells him, you've got to pitch into some of these people. You've got to make an example. So they, they kill 140 people. And this is done. They, they claim, the Mormons claim, that it was done by the Indians. But then, uh, of course, the, the problem is that the people are all killed by gunfire. And these poor Indians, impoverished as they are, have very few guns, not enough to do this entire operation. Now, the, the reason for picking this Arkansas group is that Parley Pratt, in the, he had 11 wives. Parley Pratt had 11 wives, but he decided he needed a 12th wife. So he decided to steal the wife of a guy from Arkansas. And the guy from Arkansas took violent exception to Parley Pratt taking his wife and the children and putting them in this harem. So, uh, he killed Parley Pratt. Now, this, of course, this requires blood atonement, right? It's, it's, uh, 
this is a crime of passion according to many legal systems, but no, uh, got to have blood atonement. So uh, Polly Pratt is, is uh, he's hoist by his attempt to get the 12th wife. This is the great-grandfather of Mitt Romney and the one that put Romney, the Romney family on the map. So uh, the word is then spread among the Mormons that the, the Arkansas party are not only the people who killed Polly Pratt, but some of them are also the people that killed Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois, back in 1844. So they're killed. Now, let's connect the Mormon massacre. Well, first of all, we'd say if the, Mo- if the, if the Mountain Meadows massacre is the Trojan War, then the Paris of the peace, Paris meaning the guy who goes and steals the woman and starts the, uh, the fighting, that's Polly Pratt, because he went and stole the Arkansas guy's wife, and that's the root uh, of, of, the, of the conflict. But then we need to factor in people who are around Romney today, that he's chosen, right? Maybe you say, oh, he can't choose Polly Pratt. All right, let's look at his transition boss. Let's look at his probable future White House chief of staff. That's Mike Levitt. Now, three things about Mike Levitt. First of all, Building up to the 2007th anniversary, there was forensic research done at the site of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and it was found that most of the human remains showed that people had been killed by guns, including children, babies, killed by guns. It means not by Indians, but by Mormon gunmen. As soon as Mike Levitt, who was then the governor of Utah, saw what was going on, he said, oh, this is torture for the families. We need closure bury everything immediately, take all the human remains and inter them, and that's the end of it. In other words, a cover-up to hide the enormity of what the Mormons under Brigham Young had done, killing all these people, including these very young children, shooting them. Number two, in 1999, building up to the Salt Lake City Olympics, question of polygamy came up, a lot of world attention on Utah. Levitt, the transition boss and probable future White House Chief of Staff, says, that polygamy is covered as religious freedom. No. The, the uh, religious opinion, you can have anyone you want. But when it becomes an overt act, then it is subject to applicable law. All religions are subjected to the needs of law and order. And, uh, and therefore, the, since this uh, polygamy is illegal in the, in the United States, this is not, not the case. So Levitt had endorsed polygamy basically in 1999. He's now on his way to become the White House Chief of Staff. How does that grab you? And the third one, when Romney boasts of his work in saving the Olympics, he didn't go there to save the Olympics. He went there to save the Mormon hierarchy. Because the story was that in building up to the Salt Lake City to get the bid for the Winter Olympics, the saints, the Mormon saints and the Mormon hierarchy, gave out about a million dollars worth of bribes to officials of the International Olympic Committee in the form of tuition, remission, and other uh, payments. And the most obvious person who was going to go to jail in this was Mike Levitt, the current transition boss and the current chief of staff. The people who who took the fall, Dave Johnson, top Mormon, and um, Thomas Welch, they were essentially scapegoated. Well, they, they were guilty, but they took the entire fall for the higher-ups, uh, the, the case was then dismissed by Judge Sam. Think of him as son of Sam. The Mormon judge, Judge Sam, U.S. Federal District Judge Sam, a Mormon, the son of Sam uh, threw the case out. So Dave Johnson and, and uh, Thomas Welsh got off. But Johnson and Welsh loudly stated that what was going on was a cover-up and that Mike Levitt was heavily implicated. And you can read Romney's book. Romney wrote a book about this, telling how great he is, called Turnaround. And even Romney says the governor, Mike Levitt, was widely accused. Uh, and uh, we, we can see this in other published sources. The New Yorker uh, story has the same thing. So what Romney was doing was covering up for Levitt and who? The first president of the church, the quorum of the 12 apostles, and so forth. So... The Mountain Meadows Massacre is not a dead issue, but it lives in the Romney campaign and above all through the choice of Mike Levitt, transition boss and probable future White House chief of staff. The American people have got to learn 
these things. You can't make an informed choice unless you're aware of the historical background. So, we'll see you next week on World Crisis Radio. Tarpley.net, Tarpley.net, Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed. Uh, watch Tarpley.net. We'll have something about Romney <laughs> very, very soon. Bishop Romney's tradition, I think it's going to be. Bishop Romney's tradition, polygamy, theocracy, and secessionism, uh, and the Mormons, from which he says he derives his tradition. And I, I take him at his word. I think he probably does. So what is that tradition? Uh, we've got Dinesh D'Souza running around saying, oh, we're allowed to look into uh, Obama's father because Obama wrote Dreams of My Father. Well, let's look at his father and see what the dreams might be. And from this, he derives a completely fictitious anti-colonial program. Well, Obama is the main exponent of colonialism in today's world. It's colonialism under the cover of color revolutions, the overthrow of Ben Ali, the overthrow of Mubarak, the overthrow of Gaddafi, the civil war in Syria of Yemen, all done by uh, Obama. But, again, his method says it's legit to look at the father. Well, I did look at the father. Take a look at Barack H. Obama, the unauthorized biography. Take a look at Obama, the postmodern coup, which is, again, warning about color revolutions. Um, so if uh, Dinesh D'Souza can do that in his movie, right, uh, 2016, I think it's called, if that's legit, then it's plenty legit to look at this very tight-knit, tradition-oriented, uh, you know, tinged with fanaticism, Mormon community. And we'll have, we'll, I hope if we have some time, we can talk about George Romney. New discoveries about George Romney, and not pretty, the father of the current uh, candidate. Well, let's, let's do it in honor of uh, Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, here's the problem with, with Romney now. What Romney needed to do when you had these attacks, starting on September 11th uh, in Cairo and in Libya, right? two attacks going on, it would have been wise for Romney, and this is what, what all of these Republicans and, and so forth have been saying, is you should shut up for a while and let the crisis hit Obama, right? saying, oh, Obama, you promised us singing tomorrow's with the color revolutions, you helped to overthrow Mubarak and Ben Ali and Gaddafi, and you're, you're leading, leading the charge against, uh, against Assad in Syria. And now we have these results. Why, they still hate us. They still hate us. Look at these, look at these uh, embassy demonstrations, right, by the crowd of dupes and by then the armed hardcore of professional killers in the middle of it sometimes. Um, and this, just, just let Obama take the fall, right? It's, it's tarnishing his entire, his entire uh, outlook, right? His entire uh, heritage, right? His, his legacy from the first term is going up in smoke. So Romney, shut your yap, go to the sidelines, and let the crisis damage Obama. And instead, Romney is so stupid, so inept. He's got this, this thing. He really is a robot, right? It, in other words, the robot is programmed... If, if anybody says apologize or, you know, we deplore or we regret, then Romney's got to go into overdrive saying, you know, that's treason, you're sympathizing with the enemy, and so forth. And this was so stupidly done that this has now blown back in Romney's stupid mug. However, if this stuff goes on, right, if we get some hostages, if we get some more assassinations, and so on, then things will look a little bit different, and what the the uh, Romney uh, gaffe, the Romney ineptitude, will probably be then overtaken by the uh, general tragedy of the situation, which does it points to the real thing that under Obama, Al Qaeda has taken over Libya, uh, the death squads have taken over uh, Libya, and the Muslim Brotherhood has taken over Egypt, and is that a good thing? Uh, both of these groups funded and controlled by the Saudis. And again, concerning that death squad operating near Benghazi, I think um, they would look to the U.S., but they'd also look to the Saudis, because the Saudis are, uh, in many cases, the paymasters. Now, a couple of other things to wrap up this profile of these, uh, these demonstrations. 
Uh, people now see the Arab Spring was a hoax. Yes, the Arab Spring was a hoax. It was not a real revolution anywhere, as far as I can see. The aspirations of these populations have now been stimulated, but they have not been uh, satisfied. In other words, the depression goes on. The world economic depression continues to lash these populations like everybody else. And, of course, here it's much further down the road, so they are up against all kinds of existential uh, need. Um, the, these places need a second revolution. Uh, you know, from the, Octo- the February Revolution in Russia to the October Revolution, you probably need a second revolution to put some kind of uh, actual revolutionary government place. This has not happened. And above all, the places that need a real revolution, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Jordan, Morocco, uh, Oman. These are the places that still need a first revolution. Um, and I think it is, it is important to point out that the, the violence and the, uh, the ideology that causes uh, these violent events, as we're seeing, is largely financed by Saudi Arabia. In other words, the overthrow of the Saudi monarchy would probably be the single biggest contribution that one could make to a pacification of relations between the Christian, Orthodox, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, and other worlds on the one hand, and the Muslim world on the other. In other words, the the irritant, the thing that causes friction, is certainly not the middle class of Algeria or Egypt or any, any place like this. It's the Saudis and the fact that since they are so backward, They've got to finance these militant, backward uh, people, which is what they, what they then fund. So if you didn't have the Saudi monarchy, you wouldn't have these Wahhabites uh, churning out um, their uh, recruits and so forth. So that's, uh, that's that picture. Now, let's, um, let's go on to George Romney. Let's go on to this. We want to talk about the Romney family. Um, the point being, there, as, again, in this case, right, um, Romney does this big, super patriotic trip about how he loves the United States and how he just, he just boils over with resentment when anything happens to our flag or anything like this. Well, this is really hard to uh, reconcile with the tradition of the Romney family. Now, let's just go back to this, right? We have Miles uh, A. Romney coming from uh, a small town in England near uh, Liverpool um, back in the 1840s, joining up with um, with uh, Joseph Smith at Nauvoo, Illinois. This is uh, the first Romney, Miles A. Romney, from Lower Penwortham near Liverpool, England. Uh, converted by Mormon missionaries in 1837, and again, without some kind of permission from the British government, you just don't get to do this. It is a police state. It has been a police state in some ways since uh, since we had the poor Sweevens under Queen Elizabeth I in the mid-1500s. But uh, this is where it starts. So we'll, we'll use the last two segments more or less to tell that story and say a word about the Antietam and South Mountain and Harper's Ferry's anniversary. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with everything at uh, Tarpley.net, Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed. And above all, uh, take a look. There'll be this uh, the written report, special report, book, uh, Bishop Romney's Tradition about polygamy, theocracy, and secessionism. So, Miles A. Romney... Uh, in 1841, left uh, northern England, right around Liverpool, made the journey to Nauvoo, Illinois. He was a skilled carpenter, went to work on the Nauvoo Temple, uh, arriving in uh, Nauvoo, and then uh, their son, Miles Park Romney, important guy, born August 18, 1843. So Joseph Smith assassinated in June 1844, Faction fight to take over, right? Uh, leadership struggle. 
won by Brigham Young. Unfortunately, the Romneys are too poor to join the first uh, wagon train going from uh, Illinois to <coughs> to Nebraska, right, to the so-called winter quarters, and then on to Salt Lake City. Uh, so they've got to uh, stay behind and try to build up some money. But when they get there, Salt Lake City, uh, Miles A. Romney is put to work on the Salt Lake City Temple. Now, they have a family. Uh, one of their sons is George Romney. George Romney takes up arms against the United States already in 1857-58. George Romney, this would be the current Romney's great-great-great-uncle or something like this, the eldest son of Miles A. Romney and Elizabeth joins a brigade of Mormon Danite militia preparing to hold a line of trenches blocking the passage through the Echo Canyon. This is where one of the main modern roads goes through. If you're coming from Colorado and further east, you got to, the easiest way is through this Echo Canyon. The Mormons have fortified this against who? Against the United States, against U.S. troops on U.S. territory. So this is armed rebellion, this is treason, and this is 1857-1858. Miles Park Romney, the direct ancestor of the current candidate, wanted to go to join the armed Danites in the trenches to fight against the United States but the Mormon uh, totalitarian regime told him he had to stay in town and keep doing what he wanted. Um, Miles P. Romney was uh, told by Brigham Young when to get married, how many wives he should have. Uh, Mitt Romney is obviously embarrassed. Here's what, what Mitt Romney says in one of his campaign biographies. They were trying to build the generation out there in the desert, so he, Miles Park Romney, took additional wives as he was told to do. And I must admit, I can't imagine anything more awful than polygamy. Hmm. But that's what you're working for in heaven, uh, Mitt. You're working for a celestial harem. Isn't that the word from Kolob out there? So um, this is a very, very strange uh, uh, thing. This is also what you hear from uh, from Glenn Beck, right? Glenn Beck says, no, it was not really theology. It was just Demography. So many men had been killed by these awful uh, mobs and oppressors, and that is, of course, true, but that the, the polygamy was a response to that to try to keep a certain uh, number of people around. This is, this is absolutely not true. The polygamy had started long before uh, these large numbers of, uh, of victims. Uh, we have the story of Hannah Hood Hill Romney. Uh, that's his first wife, Come, came from Canada, from Toronto, uh, this unfortunate woman uh, married Miles Park. Miles Park was then told very soon after the wedding, Brigham Young says, you're going to go to England, <clears throat> and this is all on your own expense, right? There's no travel budget. You're told to do it, uh, <clears throat> so he's sent off. This uh, Hannah Hood Hill Romney is the victim of polygamy, of abandonment, because when she leaves... Um, Miles A. Um, A. Romney doesn't doesn't send her any money, right? He just doesn't doesn't care. So Miles Park Romney is uh, I'm sorry, Miles Park Romney is now off to uh, to Britain, leaving his wife behind, not uh, providing anything for her. She has to become a, a drudge, a washerwoman. Too bad for her, I guess, in the Mormon world. Uh, so Miles P. Romney gets over there and starts writing for the Millennial Star. In October 1864, right, when you have, uh, you know, battles going on around Petersburg, battles going on in the Shenandoah Valley, battles going on, we're going to have the Battle of Nashville and all this stuff. What does Miles P. Romney do? He attacks the United States from abroad, uh, talking about how the wonderful Mormons are being persecuted by the awful uh, U.S. regime. So um, this, again, this is a, not a very uh, patriotic story for uh, Mitt. So 1867, Brigham Young orders Miles Romney to join the ranks of the polygamist, take a second wife, uh, the poor Hannah Hood Hill. Romney is in despair. Um, Miles P. Romney is basically a flunky for Brigham Young, goes, you know, does everything Brigham Young tells him. Not every Mormon was this slavish, right, this dog-like in following the, uh, the, the uh, orders of the prophet. Takes the second wife. Um, the second wife 
um, psychologically can't do it. She wants full-time attention. That marriage ends in divorce. Then there are going to be other wives. Um, their son eventually is Gaskell Romney. That's the direct, uh, the direct uh, ancestor of Mitt. So now, uh, in 1882, we have the Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act. Right? The U.S. government had declared polygamy illegal in the Morrill Act of 1862, and the uh, Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act attempts to put more teeth into that. So uh, Miles P. Romney is now just sent away 400 miles southeast across the Colorado River to St. John's, Arizona. And here we have a newspaper battle between the Mormon-published Orion era and the anti-Mormon Apache chief. So here's what we hear from the Apache chief, the anti-Mormon paper about Miles P. Romney. He's a mass of putrid pus and rotten goose pimples, a skunk with the face of a baboon, the character of a louse, the breath of a buzzard, and the record of a perjurer and common drunkard. I wonder what the Apo research could do with that uh, today. Mitt's uh, great-great-uncle, that is to say the same uh, George, right, the George that we saw out there ready to, to fight against the United States, forces was arrested under the federal anti-polygamy law and spent six months in prison. So they got a jailbird in the family. Uh, in 1885, in April, Miles P. Romney leaves the United States and flees to Mexico. Isn't this interesting? When the question is, do you support the United States? Are you an American patriot? Or do you want to go and practice polygamy? The Romney say, polygamy forever. Viva Mexico! So Mexico and polygamy trumps the United States and the Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act. So they go to um, Colonia Juarez, Mexico. On September 24th, 1890, William Woodruff of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, essentially bows to necessity and says, I just had a revelation that uh, we should now end the practice of polygamy. And this is because there was, they, they, first of all, they knew that they could never get into the Union if they kept having this polygamy going. And the other thing is, even more urgent, was that there was a new law which was going to allow the confiscation, the seizure of all Mormon church, LDS property. Uh, it's like, a little bit like the RICO statute, right? That if you're engaged in criminal activity, we're going to seize your assets. So he says, I publicly declare my advice to the Latter-day Saints is to refrain from contracting any marriages forbidden by the law of the land. And there was the, the escape clause was that if you were in Mexico, if there was no explicit law against polygamy, you could go on doing it. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to <coughs> World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C., where the pollen count is high. Uh... We're just going through the uh, the story of the Romney family. Romney family values, number one, polygamy, not patriotism. Uh, let me just say, though, before we, we continue with that, just so that we, we mark these uh, Civil War anniversaries, this is a very big one, right? We're just, uh, today's September 14th. 150 years ago, we had the Battle of South Mountain near here. Uh, General McClellan had gotten a hold of Lee's secret orders and had uh, realized what the Confederates were doing during this invasion of Maryland. And of course, this was all coordinated with the British attempting to get a British-French intervention into this uh, situation. This is actually the, one of the most dangerous crises because of the British and the French lurking in the background. And this is where the U.S. envoy to St. Petersburg goes to the Imperial Russian Foreign Ministry and gets a declaration of support that Russia will not allow the British and the French to attack the United States. And this is backed up by a pretty serious uh, ultimatum. And this makes, the, makes uh, Lord Russell and Lord Palmerston and Gladstone in London, as well as Napoleon III, back down. So the anniversaries we're going through right now are today... Uh, September 14th, 1862, it's the Battle of South Mountain, 
with uh, McClellan successfully punching through these passes and driving Lee back on uh, Sharpsburg near the near the Potomac, Antietam Creek, Sharpsburg, Maryland. On the 15th, uh, the Confederates uh, seize Harper's Ferry and take uh, many thousand U.S. prisoners. Uh, a disaster. Actually, the, it's the biggest disaster until uh, the Philippines in uh, in in 19. Uh, 42 in uh, World War II. On September 17th, we have the Battle of Antietam. This still remains the biggest one-day battle in U.S. history. 12,000 U.S. casualties, 12,000 plus Confederate casualties, 11,000 plus uh, Lee's army decimated, and he then retreats across the Potomac. And of course, the objection that Lincoln had was that McClellan did not do what was necessary to uh, to obliterate, to annihilate Lee's army. We needed a battle of annihilation to bring this entire thing to an end. And McClellan, whatever his, his tactical uh, effects in this battle were, was not thinking in terms of battles of annihilation. He was thinking, I think, in, in terms of a negotiated peace, and he also had this other fantasy going on that he could actually have a, a coup d'etat. At the same time, Braxton Bragg was attacking in, uh, in, uh, into Tennessee, in uh, northern Mississippi. So we have these two battles of Yucca and Corinth, and this is one of the places where uh, Grant shows his superior uh, generalship. Uh, so it's only when we have Lee driven out of Maryland and uh, the, the Van Horn and Price uh, driven out of Tennessee and back uh, into uh, northern Mississippi that, uh, that this, uh, this very acute danger comes to an end. So people should, uh, should take a look at that. The, their, you know, look on the, uh, on the various uh, websites. And the, the significance of this is next week, the 22nd of September, is the issuance of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. That is the political effect of these military actions. It was enough of a victory for Lincoln to override objections from Seward and others in the cabinet. This would not seem like a desperate shriek of the U.S. trying to foment a slave rebellion in the Confederacy while the Confederates were uh, apparently winning. This was now principal and military necessity joined and obviously perfectly legal under the Constitution. You can't engage in armed rebellion, and then turn around and demand uh, constitutional uh, rights. This just, it doesn't work, as General Sherman often said. But in any case, as long as you're in rebellion, you're subjected to war measures, and that can easily mean freeing of slaves. So this is the death knell of slavery. That is why this, this time, right, 150 years ago, is so important, right, the, the uh, extirpation of human chattel slavery from the United States with the Emancipation Proclamation and then everywhere under the 13th uh, Amendment, because the Emancipation Proclamation only applies to areas that are in rebellion, right? So it's not a universal wipeout of slavery. That is, that is necessary in order to make it legal at the time and not create an additional constitutional crisis. But Lincoln was able to do all of that. So hats off to Lincoln, as always. And uh, something to celebrate, the 22nd of September, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation to begin the process of wiping out slavery uh, and of winning the war. Because, as Lincoln said, if you don't use the lever of uh, emancipation in the way that he did, you can't uh, hope to defeat the Confederates. And this is why we've had this uh, slogan, right, the answer to 1984 is 1776. Yes, but uh, 1776 alone will not do it. It's got to be 1776 supplemented by 1861 to 1865. And above all, January 1st, 1863 is when that preliminary Emancipation Proclamation coming out next week, 150 years ago, when that is actually the uh, Emancipation Proclamation the slaves in areas rebelling against the United States will be henceforth and forever free. Henceforth and forever free. So that's, those anniversaries are all uh, around us uh, right now. Now let's just go back to the, uh, 
to this polygamous uh, stuff. Uh, really, the ban on polygamy of uh, September 1890 by William Woodruff of the Mormons, this is really public relations. Um, it has to be repeated several times. One interesting case um, is that uh, when we have Joseph F. Smith, I think it's Joseph Fielding Smith, the nephew of the prophet, he becomes the first president and uh, later on, he says, "Oh, we've, we've, we've uh, this is about 1905." He he declares a second ban on polygamy, but he continues in secret to uh, continue conducting polygamous marriages. Plus, you had the 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 top leaders of the Mormon Church were living as polygamists until 1945. It looks like the last one was Heber uh, Grant, who kept practicing polygamy in public. Now, what does Mitt Romney think about all this? In the 2000 book, 2004 book Turnaround, he, sa- he never mentions the word polygamy. He talks about the Mormons. This is what he says. He wants to portray his ancestors as victims. The same thing we saw with Glenn Beck. The quote from Romney, quote, Theirs was a life of toil and sacrifice, of complete devotion to a cause. They were persecuted for their religious beliefs, but they went forward undaunted. Wait a minute. It's not your beliefs. It's an overt act which leads then to uh, intolerable abuses. Polygamy is intolerable, and the byproducts, right, which is uh, essentially statutory rape on a vast scale, this is unacceptable, right? This takes you outside of Christianity and outside of Western civilization. Uh, and has Romney reformed since 2004? No. In his campaign bio- biography of 2010, this is the No Apologies volume, he says, this is now Mitt Romney writing about his father, My father knew what it meant to pursue the difficult. He was born in Mexico, where his Mormon grandparents had moved to escape religious persecution. That's not what it was. They were escaping uh, prosecution under federal laws banning polygamy, which they insisted on practicing. Um, the other interesting thing is the attitude uh, of, the, of these Mormons towards, uh, towards the, the, uh, the Mexican Revolution, right? If, if Pancho Villa drove them out. In other words, the Romneys would have stayed in Mexico until the present day if Pancho Villa and his revolutionary army had not come around in the state of Chihuahua, where Colonia Juarez was located, and driven them back into the United States, right? We would have been rid of them forever with their with their polygamous uh, colony, but no, unfortunately, they had to come back come back here. So that's the story. In the next week, we'll have uh, George Romney working for pro fascists in the aluminum industry, George Romney working for pro fascists in the automobile industry, and George Romney as a devotee of the pro fascist moral rearmament movement of Frank Buchman, the so-called Buchmanite moral rearmament, and this was the basis of Romney's 1968 campaign, which did not go over well. And we'll see you 